What if Naruto and Sasuke was a new god part 1 team 7, DXD by Rizufi. Sasuke was intimately familiar with that term. Physically, emotionally, and even spiritually familiar with it. Witnessing his beloved older brother slaughtering his entire family line had nearly broken him at the tender age of 7. Not only had Itachi made him rewatch every single kill he had wrought unto the Uchiha bloodline, but he had also physically broken him, leaving him in a hospital with multiple broken bones. Though, the emotional pain far outweighed the physical. Sasuke had been betrayed by one of the most important people in his life. Someone he thought he knew with his entire core and being had ended up being something straight out of a nightmare from the deepest pits of his imagination. With this pain, he had been blinded by anger and hate. Betraying those he loved for power. Betraying those he had respected due to a misguided view on life. Sasuke had been blinded by revenge for the majority of his young life. He had always felt trapped in a pool of his negative emotions, desperately clawing at walls that did not exist. His sanity had slowly dwindled into nothing by the time he was 16. The title of Avenger had come easily to him. Avenge his clan. Avenge his parents. Avenge his anger. Avenge his actions. Blinded by a philosophy he created to justify his actions, he had inevitably became what he had tried so desperately to destroy. A monster not unlike his brother. And yet, when he learned the truth about Itachi, he had fallen deeper into insanity. Further tarnishing his name and bloodline while welcoming agony and hate into his veins, he had become something worse and he had never questioned his actions. It would take a miracle to pull him out of the depths he had purposely created for himself. And yet, that's exactly what Naruto had done. Even as they both bled out, missing arms in tow from their heated battle, Sasuke could safely say that he had never felt better. Even during his most darkest phase, he had someone that was willing to dive into that pitch black hole, risking their life and very being just to help pull him out. You better not be dead. You armless bastard. A strangled gasp followed the individual's statement followed by a pained grunt. All. All K kick your ass again. Sasuke smiled, actually smiled, as he heard Naruto speak. Mustering up enough strength to turn his head towards Naruto's position, he spoke raggedly. Shut. Up. Idiot. You lost an arm too. A short wheeze followed his words. Naruto was motionless for several minutes, his chest slowly rising and falling. His cerulean orbs were tired but yet they carried a brightness that rivaled the sun itself. Sasuke would have shaken his head if he had the energy to do so. Naruto clearly wasn't human. If he considered himself the darkness that would consume all life, then Naruto was the light that shone brightly, smothering the very darkness that tried so desperately to swallow everything within its grasp. Sakura-chan. As coming. Naruto said with a small smile, a strand of blood dribbling down his chin. We'll be. Okay. Sasuke did not bother replying and chose to rest his eyes. Fighting in a multiple day war had finally taken its toll on his body. From fighting revived zombies of former shinobi, to fighting a literal goddess, and eventually fighting, and losing, to his best friend. One couldn't blame Sasuke for being so tired. Maybe. Just maybe. I can put my trust in someone again. Mismatched orbs studied the calm expression on Naruto's face before slowly closing. Thank you, Naruto. With those final thoughts Sasuke succumbed to darkness. A darkness that he welcomed with open arms. Naruto blinked several times before hearing the soft crunch of mineral and rock. He turned his head towards the direction of the noise, which was far harder than he would ever admit, and spotted Sakura. A grin came to his face, his eyes clenching shut, not seeing the worried and concerned gaze of his female teammate. Sakura-chan. He exclaimed tiredly, though he made sure to add in a bit of excitement to his tone. You wouldn't mind healing us, right? He chuckled quietly after his words and chose to keep his eyes closed. The pink-haired medic of Team 7 stared at her two incapacitated teammates with tears in her eyes, her emerald orbs studying the damage to both of their bodies with a minor grimace. Bruising. Chakra exhaustion. Torn ligaments. Broken bones. Sakura shook her head before kneeling beside Sasuke, her hands glowing green, and began to run a diagnostic of his body. You should have seen it Sakura-chan. Naruto's tired voice resounded out once again. I kicked his ass. A hearty laugh escaped the blonde teen followed by a rather harsh coughing fit. The blonde Jinchuriki released a quiet string of curses that brought a smile to the Kunoichi's face. Sakura ran her glowing hands across the Uchiha's chest before speaking patiently. Naruto, please stop talking. Your injuries are bad enough. Her smile twitched into a tiny frown as Sasuke grimaced quietly. Sakura, she heard him say quietly, I'm, I'm sorry, for everything. Tears flowed freely down her face at the teen's apology. She sniffled several times before wiping her eyes, trying to dry her tears. Just. Be quiet. 
I need to focus. She continued to heal the Uchiha's more prominent injuries before speaking once more. An apology isn't enough for me, Sasuke-kun. You'll need to work for my forgiveness. The Uchiha did not reply for several seconds before eventually garnering enough strength to nod his head. I w will. Sakura continued her work diligently, sweat pouring down her face as she worked her magic. She was so focused on her task that she missed Kakashi's entrance. The hand that rested on her shoulder made her physically jump but the voice that followed calmed her. Don't exhaust yourself, Sakura. She slowly turned her head towards her sensei and stared at his eyes with a small frown. Both pupils were an identical shade of charcoal. It was unnatural. She was used to seeing a Sharingan in his left and an ebony orb in his right. Sighing quietly, Sakura turned her attention back to Sasuke. I won't sensei. If you could run a diagnosis on Naruto then I would greatly appreciate it. It'd save me a lot of time. Kakashi squeezed the girl's shoulder gently before making his way towards his blonde student. With hands glowing a brilliant shade of green, he ran them over the boy's body. A small frown formed on Kakashi's face as he stared at Naruto. The boy looked so tired. A stark contrast to the boy that had battled against multiple biju, a Jubi Jinchuriki Obito, a Jubi Jinchuriki Madara and then a goddess. The only other time he had seen Naruto even remotely tired was after his battle with pain. An incredibly powerful man but he certainly didn't stack up to Obito, Madara and Kagaya. I'm proud of you, Naruto. The words pouring out of Kakashi without a second thought. I'm sorry I didn't do more for you when you were younger. Kakashi's hands glowed a brighter shade of green as he chose to aid Sakura. While he may not be a medic to the degree that she was, he knew a thing or two. He'd aid where he could. Naruto grunted quietly at the action before speaking quietly. It's okay Kakai-sensei. I understand. I know how hard being alone truly can be. You don't have to apologize. Kakashi stared at Naruto before closing his eyes and hiding the tears that formed due to the boy's words. He said nothing and just nodded his head knowing that Naruto would understand. His little family was finally back together once again. Team 7. His. No their family was complete once again. It had taken an entire night but Naruto and Sasuke were finally healed. Well, as healed they'll get for now. All of their major injuries were more or less healed at the cost of Sakura nearly fainting multiple times while working on Naruto. As for their arms, well, that was a different story. Come on Sasuke, it's your arm for Kami's sake. Naruto pleaded for the fifth time, you need two of them. The ebony-haired Uchiha rolled his eyes for the sixth time before responding. For the last time, I do not need two arms. I can and will kick your ass with just one. The Jinchuriki stared at his best friend for several seconds before raising an eyebrow. I honestly didn't know you could even make jokes. That was a good one Sasuke. The boy's grin was absolutely infuriating but Sasuke would weather it. If only to deny the boy actually giving him his arm back, he didn't deserve it. It was a monument to his sins, a permanent reminder of his past actions. Shut up, idiot. He grunted out quietly before moving to carry Sakura. He bent his knees, allowing the girl to wrap her arms around his neck, before standing to his full height. Come on. Let's go release the Mugen Sukuyomi. Naruto's grin disappeared and a hardened expression replaced it. He nodded his head before lifting Kakashi and placing him on his back. Right. Let's go. Without any further words the two teens disappeared in a burst of speed towards the Shinju. While not fully healed to 100% they were perfectly capable of traveling. Once Naruto and Sasuke released the Genjutsu holding the world hostage, then Naruto would have no issues activating his sage mode and recuperating the injuries from his fight with Sasuke. He'd also like to speak with Kurama eventually but he could wait. He still only had half of Kurama's entire power due to Black Zetsu. Once Sasuke released the Biju from their Chibaku Tensai prisons then he could merge both halves of the Kayubi and Kurama would be whole again. The grumpy fox would definitely lighten up after that. As if somehow hearing Naruto's thoughts, the slumbering fox grumbled in his sleep and Naruto could make out a few words. Something along the lines of, annoying, blonde shit. He chuckled quietly to himself and ignored the brief glance that Sasuke and Sakura gave to him. Team 7 continued their journey for nearly an hour before finally reaching the battlefield. There they found the massive Shinju, fully sprouted and holding all of the shinobi that had battled Obito, Madara and the Jubi. Massive, white cocoons littered the battlefield with hundreds of massive craters and missing chunks of earth. Devastation as far as the eye could see. In the sky, there were nine gigantic pieces of floating rock. Inside each piece of earth were the nine biju that Sasuke had imprisoned during his fight with Naruto. Sasuke gently placed Sakura on the ground before turning towards Naruto. He watched as the blonde placed an unconscious Kakashi on the ground. I'm sorry Naruto. 
It was all Sasuke could really say. He didn't need to say them because he was absolutely positive that Naruto understood but he still wanted to say them, if only to ease his own conscience. Naruto's azure orbs left Kakashi before focusing on his best friend. He offered the boy a small smile before closing the distance. I know you are, Sasuke. You don't have to say it. Sasuke begged to differ but decided not to speak further. He said what needed to be said and that was that. Shoulder to shoulder they stood. The mood was rather comfortable if Sasuke had to put a finger on it. Who would have thought? Just a few hours ago both he and Naruto were at each other's throat, hurling jutsus that could destroy the major villages. Now, Sasuke glanced towards his fry. No, his brother, and then shifted towards the floating constructs of rock. He released a tired sigh before placing both of his palms together. His chakra flared for a brief moment and the spheres of earth slowly descended onto the earth. It would not be long before the biju arrived. They will attack me. Sasuke mentioned in a rather placid tone, Rinnegan dull due to an overusage. He closed said eye not a second later while his shoulders dropped tiredly. The Uchiha resisted the urge to rub his face and was only successful due to his pride. Naruto, ever the optimistic one, chuckled playfully as he wrapped an arm around his friend's shoulder. Maybe, but I'm sure I can convince them otherwise. Sasuke did not reply. You could apologize. Sakura chimed in helpfully, though by her tone she didn't sound relatively confident. I'm sure they would love that. Sasuke responded, a small dribble of sarcasm coating his words. You guys worry too much, right Kakashi-sensei? Naruto placated. He's unconscious. Sakura replied evenly, idiot, she added in not a second later. Team 7 continued to idly bicker with one another as they awaited the biju's return. Several minutes passed by before each of the nine satellites reached the earth. The meteors crumbled shortly after before cracking and breaking in half, revealing each of the biju, in their entire glory. Naruto's face broke into a huge grin as he ran towards the other half of Kurama, greeting him boisterously. Kurama, it's good to see you buddy, he jumped onto the giant fox's snout, knees bent and hand raised in a single finger salute. The other half of you is still sleeping, he's all tuckered out from Sasuke and I's fight. The giant fox stared down at its other halves Jinchuriki before focusing on the other three humans in the area. Crimson, slitted orbs regarded the humans with thinly veiled disdain before the massive biju spoke. Why does he still breath? Kurama spoke with genuine annoyance lacing his tone. Like all those of his blood, they only seek to destroy. Naruto didn't get to respond to Kurama as one of the other biju did so for him. That biju being the nibi, Matabi. Nay, Kurama. Take it easy. The feminine voice of the giant cat spoke calmly. You already know why the child walks. You just want to be angry. Kurama replied in a snappy manner as he directed his gaze upon Matabi. Silence. It matters not if I know. This child treated us like that wretched ancestor of his. Death would be a blessing. Before any of the other bijus could speak, Naruto did so. Now now now, Kurama. We don't gotta go that far. He chuckled nervously when Kurama's blazing eyes focused on his own. He coughed quietly before placing his palm on the beast's fur. Just trust me, partner. He's changed. We can always kick his ass later though. He added with a giant grin. The Kayubi contemplated Naruto's words for several seconds before scoffing quietly and closing his eyes. Get off me, annoying brat. Naruto cackled loudly before hopping off the fox's nose, landing easily on the earth. I love you too, furball. A clenched fist rose towards the Kayubi, patiently waiting for the action to be mimicked by the nine-tailed fox. Each of the other biju stared at the child silently, waiting to see if Kurama would reciprocate the action. It took an entire minute but eventually the beast rose its human-like hand and gently tapped its fist to Naruto's. When their fists connected, a burst of chakra was sent directly into Naruto. The chakra traveled through Naruto's entire being before reaching the other half of Kurama. The giant beast stirred for a moment before opening one of its eyes. It was silent for several seconds before speaking through the mental connection it shared with Naruto. Join me. The process will be far easier. The half of Kurama that existed outside of the seal stared into Naruto's eyes before glowing a brilliant shade of orange. The sentient construct of chakra became shapeless before seemingly getting sucked into Naruto's seal. Naruto's eyes widened exponentially for a moment before he shook his head. He rubbed his eyes several times before releasing a breathy exhale. Ah! He exclaimed short of breath. That felt so weird. He glanced down towards his stomach before patting his seal with a small smile. Good to have you back, buddy. What a surreal experience. Sakura commented lightly from her position on the ground. Her emerald orbs traveled across each of the unique-looking beasts as she waved with a tired smile. Hello. My name is Sakura. It's nice to meet you all. Yo, 
Shukaku, the Ichibi said, screamed, in response. Greetings, young one. I am called Matabi. Matabi, the Nibi, responded politely. It is nice to meet you as well. You can call me Isobu. Isobu, the Sanbi, greeted quietly in tow. Yo, I am the mighty son Goku. Bow before me. The Yanbi, son Goku, bellowed out proudly with a mighty roar. You are much too loud son Goku. Hello child, I am Kakuo. The Gobi greeted politely with a minor bow. The giant dolphin horse hybrid seemed to almost kneel. Ooh, how exciting. Hello, I am Saiken. It is a pleasure to meet a friend of Naruto-kun, Saiken. The Rokubi greeted in a bubbly manner. The creature's slug-like body seemed to writhe in a manner that signified its joy. You, call me Chomei, aka Lucky Number 7. Chomei, the giant beetle buzzed happily as it flew into the air, doing several spins and flips. Gyuki, the Hachibi, Gyuki, greeted with a simple wave. Sakura stared at each of the beasts as they introduced themselves with an odd expression on her face. She hadn't known that the Biju had names. Well, it made sense. Who'd want their name to be defined by their most distinctive trait? And you already met Kurama. He's kind of an ass but you get used to it. Naruto supplied helpfully with a small smile. His cerulean orbs traveled towards Sasuke and he rose a single eyebrow at the small frown marring his friend's face. I wish to apologize. To each of you. Sasuke stated as he slowly walked towards Naruto's position. I treated you all like mere pets. Stealing your power for my own gain. The Uchiha kneeled on one leg while placing the palm of his right hand on the earth. Please, forgive me. The eight remaining biju all stared down at the human with varying degrees of expressions and feelings. This was the first time that a human had bowed to them, let alone apologized to them. It was. Different. You truly only live because of your friend. Matabi stated before any of her fellow siblings could. If it weren't for Naruto and his desire to protect us then I would strike you where you stand. Count yourself lucky, ya yeah, bastard. Son Goku added in hotly, the temperature increasing to an almost uncomfortable degree. Now, now son Goku. Kakuo chided patiently. There is no need for your petty anger. There are bigger issues we must deal with now. Naruto nodded his head at the Gobi's words while replying. Yeah. We have to release everyone trapped in the Mugen Sukuyomi. He turned his attention to his friend who was slowly rising from the earth. Come on Sasuke. The Uchiha slowly made his way towards his best friend before raising his only remaining arm. He formed the necessary seal before placing it against Naruto's own. The two shinobi flared their chakra, just as Hagoromo Otsutsuki showed them and then. Uh, Sasuke? You are channeling your chakra correctly, yes? Of course I am you dumb bastard. I have perfect chakra control now. Well, try harder then, it's not working, you idiot. The two teens bickered for several more moments as Sakura and the rest of the biju stared at the teens with placid expressions. Naruto released a cry of aggravation before moving his hand away and exhaling heavily. Okai. Let's try this again. Super Gramps said that we both needed to form the rat seal and channel our chakra at the same time. He turned toward Sasuke who possessed a small frown before continuing. Let's try again. Without another word, Sasuke placed his hand against Naruto's before both boys closed their eyes. Orange chakra surrounded Naruto while a layer of purple chakra surrounded Sasuke. Several seconds passed by in silence as yet again, nothing happened. A pit began to form in Sasuke's stomach as he immediately caught on to what was happening. A heavy frown slowly settled on his face as he glanced towards Naruto. The boy was ranting quietly to himself, seemingly arguing with the Kyubi. He wasn't aware of what was currently happening. Sasuke's mismatched orbs left the blonde-haired teen and then proceeded to focus on Sakura. The girl's gaze was calculating as she stared it out into the distance, mind working a mile a minute. She had her thumb resting on her bottom lip with her eyebrows furrowed. Forehead creased as her eyes began to slowly widen. She was going to catch on soon. This, this wasn't good. The jutsu, it wasn't working. He and Naruto had channeled their chakra perfectly. Doing exactly what Hagoromo had told them to do to release the Mugen Sukuyomi. No, no, it couldn't end like this, it, it can't. Adrenaline surged throughout his body as his heart pumped rapidly. A distinct ringing noise resounded through his ears and his eyes became unfocused. Sasuke wasn't even aware of the fact that his hands were shaking nor was he focused on the incessant rambling from Naruto. His eyes grew unfocused before he eventually started experiencing tunnel vision. The jutsu wasn't working. The jutsu wasn't working. The jutsu wasn't working. The jutsu wasn't working. The jutsu wasn't working 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 the jutsu wasn't working. Saw. Why? Why wasn't it working? 
they were doing it correctly. Dot uk. Mom maybe there was another way. Maybe they were just being stupid. Yeah. That had to be it. There was no other explanation as to why the jutsu wasn't working. If he and Naruto just tried one mo. Sasuke. Sasuke felt two hands grip his shoulders roughly. The darkness that encircled his vision slowly bled away and he found himself staring directly into Naruto's concerned eyes. Hey. You okay? Sasuke blinked several times before a wave of nausea crashed into him. He soon found himself on the ground, clenching the sides of his skull as he whispered hysterically. It's not working. Why is it not working? Naruto stared at his friend with visible worry before directing his attention to Sakura and the remaining biju. He immediately noticed Sakura's horrified expression first and the feeling of vertigo slammed into him. Something. Disgusting wormed its way into the back of his mind. They're gone forever. Naruto's gaze snapped towards the bijus and he immediately took note of their solemn expressions. And no. That isn't. That. No. No. No 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 no. Sasuke. Get up. I said get up. He roughly pulled the boy to his feet, ignoring how robotic his friend seemed to be. W we gotta try again, come on. Naruto forced both of their hands together before channeling his chakra. Despite Sasuke's seemingly catatonic state, he was still lucid enough to also channel his own chakra in response to Naruto's. Nothing. No. No kami damn it no. Again. Nothing. Again. Nothing. One more time. Naruto. The angry voice of Kurama reverberated against Naruto's mind causing him to release a grimace. Hey Kurama, why you gotta help me? The jutsu, it, it's not working, he replied in a slightly hysterical manner. I don't know what's going on. The Kyubi was silent for several long seconds, long enough that Naruto had stopped to catch his breath and get it under control. You and that boy are doing nothing wrong. Naruto's fists tightened immensely at the Kyubi's words. His teeth clenched harshly as he mentally responded in a pleading tone. Kurama, please? His tone was desperate, frantic even. Filled with hope and faith, believing that his new partner and friend had the answer he so desperately needed. But, Kurama didn't have the answer that Naruto so desperately required. Kurama dipped his large head, the action being felt rather than seen by Naruto, and when he spoke, it was somber. I'm sorry Naruto. The jutsu, has failed. It was the final nail in the coffin. Tears formed and fell as Naruto dropped to his knees. His previously clenched fists now relaxed considerably and lay on the rock beneath him. Naruto's head tilted forward, spiky locks of blonde hair shadowing his forehead and upper face. His torso trembled several times but he refused to cry out. Refused to give up hope. Refused to believe that it was over. It couldn't be. It just couldn't. They had won. They won. They beat Kagaya. Defeated the Jubi. Sealed her away. Why? Why? Why 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 A scream, one filled with so much pain and sorrow, tore through Naruto's vocal cords. His forehead smashed the earthy soil beneath him as he wailed in agony. Kurama's eyes now lacked the distinct hate they once previously held. The anger and rage all but evaporated. His crimson orbs were focused on nothing in particular, just blankly staring at the water that filled his previous prison. He could feel every single bit of pain that was coursing through Naruto's body. The despair. The agony. The sadness. It was smothering, all-encompassing. Like a thick, heavy fog full of sorrow seated upon one's shoulder, relentlessly pulling them further and further into the deepest abyss known imaginable to mankind. And Kurama would weather every single one of these negative emotions. One of them had to. Their way of life was now no more. Humans were all but extinct now. It would not be long before every single human trapped in those cocoons would be converted into a white zetsu. Their power, conscious and memories siphoned from their very bodies, hollowing them and becoming nothing more than mindless drones. For the first time in all of Kurama's life, he pitied the entirety of the human race. Kagaya won after all Ji-san. What trying times. Ophis relished her. It's, silence. A quiet existence was a preferred one. The plight of others was of no concern to hers. Be it they devils, humans, angels or even her own kind. Other dragons were just as bad, if not worse, than her fellow race. Contests of power. Greed. Destruction. Ophis cared not for any of that. Instead, she sought the peace and serenity that was silence. The dimensional gap was her home. Her own sanctum where silence ruled. But now. The blank orbs of a tiny, petite child slowly trailed after the form of a behemoth-sized dragon. The dragon's most prominent feature was its red scales. Other than it being absolutely enormous, of course. Ophis' silence had been invaded, defied, interrupted. Great Red. 
The giant dragon that was currently flying around the dimensional gap without a care in the world, was an annoying pest. He had been adamant to call this place, her home, his playground. It was unacceptable. The dimensional gap was her home. He did not belong here nor was he welcomed. She had made sure to let him know this as well. Dozens of times at that. It always ended the same. He would argue with her. Antagonize her. Spew vitriol at her. Demand a fight. Ophis did not wish to fight Great Red. A prolonged fight between them would take too much time. She had already fought him once before and she was not keen on doing it once more. They were both too powerful and it would only end in another draw. But that would change soon. She had been garnering allies to aid her problem. That problem being Great Red. With the help of talented and powerful beings of all races she was sure that they could get rid of Great Red, once and for all. The Chaos Brigade, she called it. Well, she didn't name it that. She didn't care for the name. Her only goal was removing Great Red from her home. The tiny childlike form of Ophis raised her hand towards the form of Great Red who was currently flying through the iridescent skies. She formed a finger gun with her index finger and thumb before speaking in a monotonous tone, devoid of any and all emotion. Bang. Do you guys believe in the theory of parallel universes? Sakura's question resounded out into the night sky. Theory of what now? Naruto's confused voice replied only a moment later. The belief that a world or multiple worlds, not unlike our own, exist in a similar plane of existence but with major or minor differences, Kakashi supplied helpfully. Uh. The blonde eloquently replies, Idiot. Sasuke comments lightly before explaining in a simpler fashion. Another elemental nations on a different planet that isn't this one. Oh. Naruto exclaims loudly before chuckling. Yeah, I don't know. Moron. Fuck you, Sasuke, pass. The two powerful teens bickered back and forth for several minutes as the other members of Team 7 lounge under the night sky. The stars in the heavens shined brightly from up above. A campfire was situated in the middle of their little group, offering light to the four shinobi who were content to just lay about and speak about any topic they fancied. It had been nearly six months since that fateful day. It was a rough day to say the least. Multiple breakdowns, fights, tantrums, fits of despair and hopeless denials had followed suit. From each of them no less, though it had hit Naruto the hardest, he had been a wreck for the first three months, desperately trying anything and everything to undo the nightmare that had descended upon them. It was, in the end, useless. The jutsu that was supposed to release humanity from the clutches of the Shinju had failed, in spectacular fashion. They were all that remained of the elemental nations. Humanly speaking, of course, it was odd. There was a certain mystique to being the only remaining living individuals of an entire planet. At least Sakura thought so. It was kind of fascinating. She was one of the last humans in the entire elemental nations, and for humanity to revive, she obviously had a duty. That particular conversation had been relatively awful. Could you blame her? Imagine being the last of your kind that had the ability to reproduce. She would have to be the sole savior of the human race. It was harrowing. Overbearing. Annoying. Sakura had almost denied it in its entirety but that was a selfish belief on her part. She didn't want to be the woman burdened with the rebirth of mankind. Thankfully, her team understood. They still had a few years before pulling the trigger on that particular activity. Team 7 had been content with just accepting their fate, well Naruto hadn't, but Naruto rarely ever went down silently, he always needed to fight. It was just the kind of person he was, it was endearing, kind of, and sometimes, it was just outright fucking annoying. Sakura's thoughts were interrupted as Kakashi's voice resounded out. What brought this on Sakura? From her prone position Sakura shifted onto her belly, now facing Kakashi. I wonder if there's a world where the jutsu worked. Her emerald orbs studied the man's face as she continued. The possibilities are endless. Like, maybe there was a world we didn't even have a fourth shinobi war. Kakashi's eyes left the pink-haired teen as he turned towards the star-filled sky above. A gloved hand came to rest upon his chin, stroking it slowly. It's certainly a fascinating theory. I wonder if our personalities would differ. They were both interrupted by the sounds of Naruto and Sasuke struggling and grunting. The two teens were currently in a handlock, both struggling to overpower the other. Their bodies rolled along the muddy soil, tarnishing their clothes and dirtying their bodies. Stupid, one-armed bastard. Fuck you, idiot. You still have one arm, too. But I can grow mine back. Shut up. The two friends eventually rolled over the campfire, destroying it and ridding the group of their source of light. Before they could even attempt to bowl over Sakura, the girl kicked them away. With startled yelps the two teens were sent tumbling away from the girl, crashing into a rather large boulder and halting their momentum in its entirety. Don't make me punch you too, 
she threatened loudly with an angry fist. Kakashi sighed quietly to himself as he propped his head up with one of his hands. Leave them be Sakura. You know how they are. Her fist was redirected towards Kakashi as she glared at him. You want some too? She threatened. The mask-wearing Jonin just chuckled sheepishly while raising his hands in a placating manner. Please don't. Emerald orbs narrowed considerably before an angry huff vacated Sakura's body. She turned back towards her male teammates before stomping towards them while cracking her knuckles. Kakashi watched the girl stomp away from his position with a sigh of relief. He did not want to deal with an angry Sakura. The girl could destroy mountains with a single punch. No thank you. Not the face, Sakura-chan. Ah. Watch it. That's my, a grunt of pain escaped Sasuke. I. He wheezed out shortly afterwards. Ha 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 ha. Get fucked idiot. A scream of pain shortly escaped the Jinchuriki afterwards. I'm sorry. Kakashi just ignored the cries of pain. It wasn't his business. Sasuke and Naruto stirred the pot. Now it was time for them to eat it. Ophis was not in a good mood. Rarely was she ever in an actual mood to begin with. Emotions were something she didn't have but she was fairly certain that what she was currently feeling was annoyance. Leave. You leave. This is my new home. Leave. Fuck off. Ophis. Watch as I, the powerful and almighty Great Red, do several flips for style. Ophis fingers twitched, signaling that her patience had finally run thin. Tendrils of black and purple energy began to slowly leak off her petite form, forming several snake-like entities that writhed around her body dangerously. Power seeped out her form in droves and the dimensional gap seemed to almost bend to her will. The beautiful iridescent lights that made up the dimensional gap seemed to almost warp and bend as she stared at the annoying red dragon that had the audacity to call her home his. Just as her power reached its apex, Ophis felt. Something. It was fleeting. Brief. Different. The disguised dragon tilted her head in a curious manner before directing her attention to the phenomena. With great red all but forgotten, Ophis began to slowly travel towards the unique sensation. Oi. Where are you going? Great Red's words fell on deaf ears as Ophis continued her journey. The beast's golden eyes watched the tiny girl float away before scoffing loudly. Peesh. I don't care anyway. More tricks for me. The dragon released an annoyingly loud cackle before proceeding to flip through the air, wings curling beneath him as he did so. Boundless curiosity flowed through Ophis' tiny body as she traveled aimlessly through the endless space of the dimensional gap. Great Red's childish and annoying antics slowly tapered off into nothing as Ophis continued deeper and deeper into the empty void of space. Left. Straight. Right. Straight. Left. Straight. Left. Her travels were erratic yet seemed to follow some kind of rhythm. The feeling continuing to grow stronger with every second. The feeling was akin to that of a needle lightly dancing upon one's skin. It was a unique sensation for one like Ophis. How much time had passed? Hours. Days. Weeks. What was time to a being such as Ophis? Her endless travels seemed to finally stop. Slowly hovering in midair Ophis continued to survey the area she was in. There was nothing here that was out of the ordinary. The same bright, iridescent lights flashed all around her body before the sensation happened once more. This time though, it was far stronger. Blank, ebony orbs sharpened immensely before her sight focused on a particularly bright light emanating in midair. Head tilted curiously. The petite child slowly floated towards the unique phenomena. Hovering in midair was a tiny hole or tear in the dimensional gap. It was deceptively small, tiny enough to truly go unnoticed but not small enough if one were to truly focus their gaze upon it. The spatial tear couldn't have been bigger than her pinky. The infinite dragon god stared at the thimble-sized hole for what seemed like hours before she eventually raised a single digit. Her index finger gently prodded the tear with all the curiosity of a child. The hole was more akin to that of a ripple when one came into contact with water. The space surrounding the hole rippled multiple times at Ophis' action. Ophis was motionless for several long minutes before eventually prodding the hole once more. This time she used far more force and began to slowly rip the tear larger. The hole began to slowly grow in size, the light emanating from the hole growing in size and intensity. Once the hole was big enough for Ophis to fit her fist through she stopped poking it. A smile, yes a smile, formed on the girl's face before she gripped the hole with both hands, channeling a great deal of power into her body Ophis proceeded to rip the hole even further. Her action caused an immense flash of bright light to encompass her. The gargantuan pillar of light spanned out for several miles and Ophis was consumed by its ethereal glow. Why is the world shaking? Naruto cried out with only a slight bit of panic. Indeed the world was shaking with the fury of Kami herself, Team 7 had been preparing their breakfast before the very world itself began to shake violently. Naruto. 
What did you do? Sakura cried out in annoyance as she slammed her hands into the ground to prevent herself from falling over. I didn't do anything. I swear. The whiskered teen responded frantically. This isn't natural. Kakashi grunted out quietly, gripping onto Sakura's Janin vest to keep himself from being sent tumbling. Purple chakra exploded around the three individuals before a feeling of weightlessness encompassed them. The familiar form of Sasuke's perfect Suzanoo kept them all grounded as the earth beneath them gave way. The four remaining shinobi glanced down at the earth in shock, watching as the entire landscape was quite literally torn asunder. Kami. Sasuke whispered quietly as he stared down at the devastation. Naruto's eyes widened before he donned the chakra of Kurama. A golden, ethereal layer of energy spread throughout Sasuke's Suzanoo, encasing it and changing its form to that a giant nine-tailed fox samurai. The other biju. We have to save them from whatever's happening. Naruto's golden orbs met Sasuke's mismatched ones. He received a single nod and Naruto mentally ordered the chakra construct towards the biju. The Suzanoo Kurama cloak transformation flew through the air, breaking the sound barrier as it reached its destination almost instantly. Upon reaching the area where the remaining biju were located, Naruto created eight shadow clones who dashed out of the Suzanoo. The Doppler gangers reached their targets before placing a palm onto their bodies. In an instant, all eight remaining bijus turned into a unique color of chakra before being sucked into each of the Naruto clones. Once each clone was finished with their tasks they immediately disappeared in a burst of speed and reappeared in front of the unique Suzanoo hybrid. The Shinju, Sakura's startled scream drew everyone's attention, it's, it's falling. The rest of Team 7 directed their attention to the giant tree as the earth beneath it collapsed. The Shinju, along with the cocoons of humanity, descended into the earth's abyss, disappearing entirely. They, they're gone, they're really, gone, Naruto stated while falling to his knees. His blue orbs were slick with tears as he watched the chaos and destruction. His world, it was being swallowed, everywhere he looked was complete destruction and desolation, almost as if the very world itself seemed ready to implode on itself. Naruto. Hey, get it together, Sasuke kneeled beside his best friend before gripping the boy by his blonde locks and harshly yanking his head towards himself. Look at me, he ordered loudly. When the Jinchuriki refused to do so, Sasuke hit him. Hard. The Uchiha's punch seemed to rattle something fierce in the Uzumaki. The boy's golden eyes burned furiously before he returned the action. His knuckles wrapped against Sasuke's chin producing a rather loud crunching noise. Fuck you. Naruto roared back angrily. Do you not see what's happening? Our whole world is destroying itself. Tears trailed down his face as his voice cracked. What the fuck are we going to do now? Sasuke spit out a glob of blood nursing his chin with his only remaining hand. He quickly stood to his feet, mismatched orbs burning with a fire not unlike the flames of Amaterasu. I don't fucking know. He returned angrily, his forehead cracking against Naruto's with the force of a thousand men. Blood immediately trickled down both boys' face though they weren't bothered. But at least I'm not going to fucking cry about it. That's all you do now. Cry and cry and cry and cry and fucking cry. Before the two friends could come to blows Sakura placed her hands against their chest before harshly pushing them away from one another. Hey. We have more important shit to worry about now. We can't afford having both of you fighting right now. Her emerald orbs blazed fiercely as she pinned the two boys with a harsh glare. Stop fighting. Kakashi watched on quietly with his arms crossed against his chest, silently hoping that the boys would come to their senses. Sakura was absolutely correct. They couldn't afford to be fighting like this least of all Naruto and Sasuke coming to blows once more. They had fought many a time since the jutsu had failed. Though each time, they had held back, holding on to hope that one day they could save the elemental nations. Kakashi's eyes risked a glance towards the destroyed land and a heavy frown marred his hidden face. Now that the elemental nations was truly destroyed, he actually feared that the two teens would come to blows. They would certainly kill one another now that they truly had nothing to lose. After a tense minute of silence both teens slowly relented, shoulders dropping tiredly. Sakura exhaled heavily before moving her hands. Rubbing her eyes with her left, she spoke tiredly. We. We have to plan or. Do something. Plan what exactly? Sasuke asked in a slightly snarky manner. Look around us. There's nothing. What are we going to do? Before Sakura could respond, Naruto did. Hey. She's just trying to help Sasuke. I don't see you coming up with a plan. What plan? The Uchiha yelled out, tone laced with frustration. There's nothing. The Shinju. Gone. Our home. Destroyed. What in Kami's name do you propose we actually do Naruto? The whiskered Jinchuriki tightened his only remaining fist as he struggled to come up with a response. 
After several long seconds of silence he eventually huffed angrily. I. I don't know. I don't know what to do. I have nothing. Nothing. He growled angrily before throwing his hand up in defeat, tone growing quiet. I got. I got nothing. Team 7 grew quiet at Naruto's defeated tone. The only noise was from the destruction wreaking havoc upon their world. Interesting. An unknown female voice spoke through Team 7's silence. The unknown voice caused each of the shinobi to tense heavily. They hadn't even sensed the arrival of the newcomer. Sasuke's Rinnegan flared in response to the woman's presence, the tomo of his Rinnegan spinning wildly as his eyes centered on the woman who had spoke. Naruto's senses went haywire as he focused on the newcomer. He felt a sharp sting in the back of his neck before the immense presence of the individual bared down upon him. Naruto and Sasuke physically froze. Their bodies refused to move as they stared at the, the entity before them. This, this, being was far superior than Kagaya. Her power was all-encompassing. Overbearing. Suffocating. Infinite. It took everything they had just to keep themselves from falling over. A task that Sakura and Kakashi had failed. Both Janin and Kunoichi hit the floor of the Suzanoo, heads straining to keep upright. WH who? Who are you? Naruto questioned with fear seeping into his veins. The woman, or rather child, tilted her head curiously before offering a single blink. You are standing, she eventually stated. Naruto swallowed the bile in his throat before speaking hesitantly. I. Yes. I'm standing. Why wouldn't I be? The little girl showed no emotion. Scratch that. She had no emotions. You can stand in my presence, she stated again. To Naruto, she seemed almost confused. Why, is, is that not normal for you? The whiskered teen asked quietly, unsure if the girl was hostile or not. He sure hoped she wasn't. This girl's power was off the fucking charts. Even Kagaya hadn't been this overwhelming and they had struggled to beat her. Most individuals that have the ability to sense my true power cannot comprehend it. Their minds are incapable of grasping the infinity. She spoke blankly. There was a gleam developing in her eyes and it made Naruto and Sasuke nauseous. Not only can you stand but you are able to weather it, she continued while floating closer to the chakra construct. Interesting. What's your name? Sasuke questioned quietly, trying to calm his racing heart. Ophis' attention left Naruto before settling on the Uchiha. She blinked once before replying, Ophis. Naruto licked his lips nervously before responding, Uh, my name's Naruto Uzumaki. It's nice to meet you. His greeting was more of a question than a statement but the little girl didn't seem to notice or care. He was sure it was the latter. The little girl did not respond to Naruto's greeting. Instead she directed her attention to Sasuke, staring into his eyes. Sasuke Uchiha. He greeted quietly, not bothering to add any niceties. It was clear to him that the little girl wasn't exactly human. He had never encountered another being who seemed so dead to the world. There was nothing lurking in those abyss-like eyes of her that he could see. The only thing he could make out was the curiosity, and Sasuke wasn't entirely sure if that was a good thing. With a being this powerful it certainly only meant trouble. That's not to say that he and Naruto wouldn't go out fighting cuz they most certainly would. If Ophis wanted a grand fight, then she would get one. They had just lost their entire world mere seconds ago. They, or rather he at least, were just looking for a fight to vent their frustrations and anger. Heart rate now under control, Sasuke stared at the petite girl with furrowed brows, why are you here? Did you cause this destruction to our home? Waving a hand behind him as he did so, highlighting the ruinous earth below them. Ophis tilted her head before dipping her head towards the earth. She stared down at the devastation with blank eyes before raising a single finger and placing it against her bottom lip. I may have inadvertently caused this. Those emotionless orbs refocused on the Uchiha before she continued. I truly did not know what would happen once I opened the tear in the dimensional gap. Sasuke's anger flared for a brief moment before he harshly stamped it down. Blood slowly seeped down his Rinnegan as he struggled to resist outright attacking the little girl. The dimensional gap, Naruto quickly intervened, noticing Sasuke's anger immediately. W what is that? Completely oblivious to the ebony-haired teen's emotions, Ophis responded to Naruto. My home. Your. Home? Uh. Well, I've never heard of it. Cerulean orbs left the little girl for a brief moment, focusing on his best friend. What is it? The dimensional gap is the gap that exists between the three worlds, Earth, Heaven and the Underworld. Blank orbs seem to finally show emotion as she continued speaking. It is my home. Deciding to avoid angering the little girl, the blonde didn't push her any further. Heaven? Naruto questioned with furrowed eyebrows. The hell is a heaven? Heaven is a plane of existence that the biblical god rules over. Angels and the souls of pure humans call it home. 
Ophis informed. Wait, wait, wait. Naruto interjected in confusion. Angels? God? Do you mean Kami? Blue eyes turned towards his best friend and noticed that even Sasuke looked confused. Ophis tilted her head as she repeated the word Naruto used. Kami. You are referring to the Shinto pantheon. Humans worship and pay tribute to Kamis. Those like Amaterasu, Suzanoo, and Sukuyomi. They are considered to be gods. Sasuke. Naruto commented with raised eyebrows. I know. He replied quietly, in a measured tone. This talk of gods. We have nothing like that here. The only gods we have are Kami herself and the Shinigami. Ophis blinked several times in silence before witnessing movement behind the two humans in front of her. She spotted a pink-haired woman and a masked man with a head full of silver hair. Her interest rose minutely as she witnessed the two weaker humans slowly rising to their feet. Interesting. These humans, who can fully grasp just how powerful she is, are able to withstand her sheer presence and might. Turning her attention back to the more powerful duo Ophis spoke quietly. You are a part of an entirely different universe. In the dimensional gap, rarely does anything ever change. I sensed an unknown phenomena and followed it. It lead me to a small hole that shined brightly. I decided to open it. A white flash then engulfed me and I ended up here, in your world. There was silence for several minutes as the four shinobi struggled to process everything that was happening. First, their way of life gets altered by a man thought to be dead. Then, they fight an ancient beast whose presence is powerful enough to destroy their very world. Then, said beast revives a woman who had been sealed away thousand of years ago due to using the breast's power to control all of humanity. Then, they defeat the woman and reseal her. Then, the jutsu that's supposed to save all of humanity ends up not working. And now there's a little girl, with a power that can't even be comprehended, rips a hole into their universe causing the calamity of the elemental nations. Great. Fucking awesome. I honestly wouldn't mind dying at this point. Sasuke commented dryly, previous fear of Ophis now completely gone. I mean really. I'm done. Sasuke. Naruto chided in an annoyed manner. Don't joke about things like this. The Uchiha glanced towards his friend and with a face set in stone, replied blankly, It wasn't a joke. Idiot. D don't start you too. Sakura commented quietly, head still ringing due to the little girl's presence. She gingerly rubbed her head trying to stave off the migraine that was oncoming. We, the elemental nations is gone. We need to accept that now. There's, there's nothing here for us anymore. Kakashi slowly dropped to his bottom, too tired to even care about standing on his feet. Sakura is right. He placed his gloved hand on his face, rubbing his temples to alleviate the pain emanating from his head. We have nothing. And judging by the trembles, we don't have much time either. Naruto grit his teeth in frustration before turning his back on Ophis, focusing on his sensei and teammate. What can we do then? Sasuke and I can't travel to other dimensions like Kagaya, we're stuck here. Not exactly. Sasuke responded with narrowed eyes. When the rest of Team 7 directed their gaze on him, he spoke. If what Ophis says is true then, then we can live elsewhere. Ophis did not respond, her face betraying nothing. You mentioned some place called heaven, if I'm correct then the underworld is the opposite of heaven yes? Sasuke received a single nod from the dragon. If that's the case, then that would mean that earth is similar to our world. Will you take us there? He asked almost desperately. Pride be damned, he couldn't go on like this anymore. He needed a new slate. A new home. Drive. Motivation. Anything. Just something other than the monotony that Team 7 had been through for the past six months. Team 7 needed this. I can take you with me. Ophis responded blankly, but on one condition. What is it? Naruto asked with newfound hope. You must help me with an important matter. My home is the dimensional gap. And recently an unwanted guest has decided to invade it. I want him gone. Her eyes began to glow as raw power seeped out from her. And you will aid me. The four members of Team 7 shivered as the weight of Ophis power settled on their shoulders. Th that's it? Naruto questioned with furrowed eyebrows. You just want our help? How powerful is this individual that you need help in getting rid of them? Sasuke questioned with narrowed eyes. We can sense the power you have. It's infinite. What exactly are we dealing with? Instead of explaining Ophis floated away, beckoning the behemoth-sized chakra construct to follow her. The little girl slowly descended into the now destroyed core of the world disappearing into the abyss. Team 7 stared down at the abyss that Ophis traveled through in silence. What do we really have to lose? Sasuke proposed quietly with a minor shrug. Our lives. Naruto responded with a sigh. We should have lost those a dozen times by now. Kakashi supplied helpfully. I think we'll be okay. Oh, so now everyone is optimistic. Cool. 
the pink-haired medic added in sarcastically. Well, now we have a reason to be. The Uchiha replied with a small smirk. I can't wait to eat actual food. My cooking wasn't that bad. Sakura screamed angrily. True, it was way worse. Kakashi jibbed with his infamous eye smile. Naruto plastered a fake smile on his face as he responded with a thumbs up. I thought it was Griat. He convinced no one. And with that final nail in the coffin, Sakura dropped her head in defeat, skulking childishly. Come on. Let's follow Ophis. So, that's him, huh? Naruto questioned rather than stated. A single nod. Is he? Doing flips? Sakura questioned with a mild amount of confusion lacing her tone. Another nod. Well, he's pretty big. Kakashi commented lightly with his hands in his pockets. Again, another nod. Are we just going to ignore the fact that he's a dragon? Sasuke questioned in annoyance. Well, we all have eyes Sasuke. Of course we can see it's a dragon, you idiot. I'll actually kill you. I'd like to see you try, you stupid bastard. Come closer, you stupid idiot. Kakashi and Sakura both ignored the boy's bickering as they stared at the enormous red dragon who was currently doing several backflips while yelling like a child. Certainly an odd one. The veteran Jonin commented lightly. Sakura's face went through a myriad of emotions before eventually settling on a small frown. I already hate it here. Kakashi chuckled quietly, shifting his weight on his leg. Chin up, Sakura. I think our time here will be interesting. Ophis turned her back to Great Red before staring at Kakashi and Sakura. His name is Great Red. He is incredibly powerful. Many in the supernatural world believe he is my equal in terms of power. The little girl seemed to almost sniff indignantly at the comment before continuing. They would be wrong. Kakashi didn't bother calling the little girl out on her display of childish arrogance. She could smear him without so much as lifting a finger. He was going to avoid getting on her bad side. Oh, I believe you Ophis Chan. He replied jovially with his trademark eye smile. Chan? The tiny dragon girl questioned with a relatively cute tilt of the head. A term of endearment, Sakura supplied helpfully. Ophis' eyebrows furrowed for a moment as she brought her thumb up to her lips. She bit her thumb while nodding her head several times, seemingly deep in thought. I find it acceptable. You will refer to me as, Ophis Chan, from now on. She spoke or rather, demanded. Kakashi executed a two-finger salute while Sakura just helplessly nodded. It wasn't like she was opposed to it. She just didn't want to be on the little dragon's bad side. Oi, so this is really your home, seems, void. The trio turned their attention to the remaining male members of Team 7. Both boys sported a black eye with minor cuts and bruises on their faces. Ophis blinked at the question before nodding her head. Yes, this is my home. It is quiet, or it was before that idiot came. Now I am busy trying to rid myself of him. Naruto stared at the giant reptile with a raised eyebrow. Clasping his hand behind his head, he leaned on one leg before speaking. Well, why don't you just fight him? You're really strong. Just beat him and tell him to get out. Ophis shook her head as she responded. A prolonged fight between Great Red and I would take too long. I do not wish to fight for so long. So, you're using pawns to help you? Sasuke muttered while crossing his arm against his chest. Ophis stared at the teen before shrugging. If that's what they wish to be called then yes. It is not like I'm the only one who is compensated. For the individuals that help me, I grant them a portion of my power. Sounds dangerous. Sakura commented lightly. Arrogant, you mean. Kakashi corrected. I am a dragon. Ophis responded as if that was supposed to explain everything. Hold up. You're a dragon? Naruto exclaimed curiously. The little girl nodded. Then why are you a little girl? Sasuke questioned with a raised brow. Ophis shrugged as she replied. It is comfortable. So, we're just going to keep ignoring the fact that she has tape on her nipples? Kakashi questioned out loud. Can you shape shift into other things too? Naruto asked, completely ignoring Kakashi's question. I can. The dragon answered with a slight bob of the head. Ooh, can ya show me? The blonde teen asked with stars in his eyes. Oh cool. I'm just going to be ignored then. Kakashi replied in an aloof manner. What would you like to see? Ophis asked, once again ignoring Kakashi. The whiskered teen brought a finger to his chin as he thought of what he wanted to see. There was silence for several long seconds before he eventually snapped his fingers. Ah. How about an older version of yourself? The little dragon blinked at the request before her body began to morph and change. Her hair grew longer, her height increased and her body became more curvy. Impressive. Sasuke remarked with a single eyebrow raised. Naruto placed his index finger and thumb in his chin as he studied the girl's new body. Are you capable of morphing certain parts? Ophis nodded. 
Ooh, do the chest, pervert, Sakura commented in annoyance. Naruto shrugged his shoulders, it is what it is. No we're not doing that. Sasuke turned towards Ophis, who had already morphed her chest. She now rivaled the late Tsunade Senju, nice, Naruto complimented. Nice, Kakashi also complimented. Nice, Sasuke too, complimented. Fucking pigs. Sakura spit with annoyance. She absolutely was not jealous that the dragon could increase her breast size. Nope, not at all. Not one bit. Not even a little. Okay, she was fucking pissed. How unfair was that? Anyway, Naruto started after studying the busty dragon. When are we going to be fighting him? Him, being the dragon that was currently flipping through the air. Ophis narrowed her eyes as she turned towards Great Red, giant breasts bouncing as she did so. She placed her thumb on her lower lip before speaking slowly. Soon, Team 7 waited for the dragon to elaborate. And waited. And waited. And waited. Oh, so you're just not going to explain? Kakashi once again questioned in his usual aloof manner. In the meantime, Ophis said, taking her thumb away from her lip, take my power as compensation. Black tendrils of energy slowly seeped out of Ophis' skin. The condensed power writhed like snakes in the air, awaiting to be claimed. Team 7 stared at the energy masses before taking a step back. Uh, I'm good. Yeah, I'm strong enough. Count me out. Is that even legal? Ophis furrowed her eyebrows as she tilted her head. You don't want my power? She asked with a minor amount of confusion. The members of Team 7 glanced towards one another, each individual possessing uneasy expressions on their face. It was Naruto that eventually stepped forward to speak. Not to disrespect you or anything but. No, we don't. We'll just help when you call us. Is that? Okay. He questioned nervously, hand coming up to rub the back of his head. Ophis was silent for several long seconds before the tendrils of energy slowly returned. Odd. You four do not hunger for power. Sasuke scoffed quietly. Been there, done that. I'm past my power hungry days. I already have enough power. Naruto responded with a shrug. And you just got way more from the bijus. Kakashi informed with an eye smile, it's a good thing you're not a bad person, I'd be worried. You should be worried, Sasuke corrected, he's an idiot. Fuck you Sasuke, die. Hey, Sakura growled loudly, stop fighting right now. Ophis watched the four shinobi as they interacted with a keen gaze. Interesting, so very interesting, she needed to study them more, but for now, she had other things to do, like gathering more allies and pawns to aid her in her mission. Great Red needed to be killed or silenced, or sealed, or eviscerated, or exploded, or stabbed, or burned, or drowned. Yes yes yes, he needed a lot of things. Team 7 stared at the vast city of Kyoto in slight awe. Brilliant lights and towers greeted them as they overlooked the city from one of the many nearby mountains. Beautiful architecture that resembled their own home greeted them. The city greatly reminded them of home but with a slightly futuristic look to it. There were things and objects that they couldn't even understand. What were those metal objects with wheels on the roads? This is Kyoto, Japan. Ophis informed them. I believe that this city shares vast similarities with your own. It also falls under the Shinto pantheon and is a neutral faction to the devils, humans, and angels. Why is that? Sasuke questioned while studying the beautiful city. I can also sense, chakra? Naruto shook his head as he responded. No. Similar to chakra but, different. What am I sensing right now? There's, tons of these signatures. They're almost animalistic in nature. Some are even. What? Kakashi, Sakura and Sasuke all stood by silently as Naruto continued to sweep Kyoto. They knew that out of the four of them that he was the best sensor. It's strange. I don't know what or who those signatures belong to but they're all similar to one another but also different. It's weird. He commented while running the back of his neck. What you are sensing are a race of beings called Yukai, who have the ability to use Yujutsu. It is the equivalent of devil magic and various other powers. She nodded once before continuing. When I first arrived on your planet, I found that the chakra saturating your planet was overwhelming. Everything and everyone had chakra. That is not the same here. Only specific races even have the capability to harness chakra. Naruto rubbed his chin with his remaining hand before muttering quietly. Does that mean that senjutsu can be learned here? The little dragon nodded her head as she replied. Yes. In fact, one of my subordinates has mastered senjutsu. Perhaps you would like to meet her? Uh. Sure. The whiskered teen answered, mind still reeling about all this new information. Kyoto is under the jurisdiction of a woman named Yusaka. She is a Kayubi Yukai and possesses impressive power. Though, she would be no match for you too. She directed towards Naruto and Sasuke in particular. Cool. 
Third wheel it is. Kakashi commented lackadaisically. Third wheel? Get in line. I'm the third wheel. Sakura scoffed angrily, hands crossing against her chest. I'm the third strongest here. You lost an eye. Harsh. The masked Jonin commented good-naturedly, but true. A Kayubi, huh? Naruto muttered to himself. He was silent for several seconds before gathering nature chakra and accessing sage mode. His eyebrows furrowed at the negativity he could feel though it wasn't anywhere near as bad as his home planet. Shinobi had killed for sport during the darker times of the elemental nations. These feelings were relatively mild compared to that. With yellow bar-like pupils, Naruto closed his eyes as he expanded his senses through the entirety not Kyoto. He was silent for several seconds before sensing someone who carried an immense amount of power. He was silent as he continued his actions before feeling something penetrate his sixth eye. He released a surprised gasp as the individual he had been sensing, suddenly sensed him. Impressive. I thought I was being careful. That's quite the amount of power I can sense. Karama's deep, baritone voice sounded out. Karama. You're awake. Keep it down brat. It's far more cramped in here now. Naruto mentally chuckled at the grumpy response before replying. Sorry buddy. There wasn't any other place to put your siblings. There was a brief moment of silence before Karama eventually responded, his tone being soft and surprisingly gentle. Thank you for saving them Naruto, for saving us. Naruto was silent for several seconds before a grin split his features. He chuckled quietly, ignoring the looks from his team. You're welcome Karama. But really, it was no problem. You're all important to me. You're also all I have left from home besides Sasuke, Kakashi, and Sakura. The giant fox said nothing in response. He didn't need to. Naruto and Kurama had been partners since the war. They understood how one another felt now. She knows we're here. Naruto suddenly stated. She's pretty powerful. I thought I was being careful not to trigger her. Might as well pay her a visit, yeah? Kakashi commented lazily from his perch on the mountain. If I was the leader of an city and village, I would want to know the intentions of four powerful unknown individuals. Come on let's go. Sasuke responded before disappearing in a burst of speed towards the giant city. Sakura nodded her head before she too disappeared towards the city. The masked Jonin sighed quietly before slowly rising to his feet and walking down the mountain at a leisure pace. See you there, Naruto. He proceeded to then wave over his shoulder. The whiskered youth just shook his head before turning towards Ophis and offering the girl a small smile. Thanks for the help Ophis. You really saved us back there. The little dragon blinked at the praise before nodding her head once. I will continue to watch over you four. You all. Intrigue me. Goodbye for now. Naruto. With those parting words the little girl seemed to just disappear, as if never having existed, her overwhelming presence just seemed to vanish. Naruto shook his head at the action before he too disappeared in a burst of speed, catching up to Sasuke and Sakura. They're staring at us, Naruto stated quietly, they're terrible hiders, Sasuke affirmed. Leave them alone, they're just doing their job, Sakura placated calmly. The trio were now in the actual city itself and were currently walking down one of the many streets in Kyoto, occasionally admiring the art, music and architecture. Once they had actually stepped foot in Kyoto, they had been swarmed by several yukai, though the beings hadn't yet revealed themselves, but it was incredibly clear that they were a little nervous in approaching them. It's not every day that you see three humans with access to chakra in Kyoto, especially not when two of those individuals had more power and chakra than even their leader, Yusaka. Where the hell is Kakashi? Sasuke grunted out quietly, fingers itching to wrap around his kusanagi. Naruto's eyes wandered from vendor to vendor, mirror to mirror and shop from shop. He said he'd meet us later. He trailed off before sniffing the air and smiling widely. Is that ramen? Sakura's stomach decided to make itself known with a rather loud groan. The trio of shinobi immediately stopped walking with Sasuke and Naruto turning around to stare at her. The pink-haired medic returned their stares with an annoyed one before speaking. I'm hungry. The hell are you looking at? You wanna get knocked out? Her right fist waved back and forth angrily, knuckles white due to the force. The two best friends, wisely, decided that angering the beast certainly wasn't worth it. Ramen? Naruto suggested with a raised eyebrow. Ramen. Sasuke affirmed with a nod of the head. That's what I fucking thought. Sakura huffed indignantly. The two males of Team 7 did not bother commenting and made their way to a comfy looking ramen stand. Upon taking a seat at the tiny restaurant, Naruto slammed a palm to his head. We don't have any money, we can't eat. The ebony-haired Avenger scoffed quietly before reaching into one of his pockets and pulling out several bills of yen. Idiot, you didn't pickpocket? Naruto looked affronted as he replied, stealing is wrong. 
Sakura also pulled out several bills from her pocket. We're Shinobi Naruto, it's what we do. The blonde teen just crossed his arms with a huff. I'm not stealing. Sounds like a personal problem. The Uchiha replied lazily. Before the three shinobi could continue their conversation, a young woman appeared before them. Hi. Welcome to Muz Ramen, what can I get for you? Naruto glanced up towards the woman and noted that she was rather young with an incredibly curvy figure. Her hair was snow white and she possessed dimples. He could also sense. Ah, you're a yukai, he questioned rather bluntly. The beautiful woman blinked at the statement, her eyes widening. H how did you know? I can sense it, the blonde replied lazily while reading the menu of the restaurant. Ooh, I'll have a misu ramen. His eyes rose towards the woman who now seemed very frightened at their presence. He rose his hand in a placating manner before offering the woman a gentle smile. We aren't here to start trouble, we're just hungry. The white-haired yukai was about to run away before the Uchiha's head rose. She was greeted to the gaze of a unique purple orb, surrounded by several ovals with tomos in them and a crimson orb with three tomos. Calm down. He ordered calmly. Do your job. One misu ramen. One serving of tomato soup and two servings of anko dumplings. After speaking to the woman, Sasuke deactivated his sharingan before placing his chin atop his right hand. The woman immediately went to make the dishes that she was ordered to do with almost robotic-like efficiency. Oi, Sasuke, you shouldn't use your sharingan for stuff like that. The Avenger ignored Naruto's statement with an eye roll. Until the woman that leads Kyoto directly demands our attention, I'm going to do what I want. The blonde-haired teen sighed loudly before mimicking his best friend. He closed his eyes as he too rested his chin atop his palm. There was a comfortable silence for several minutes as the three shinobi reveled in the comforting atmosphere. It's a beautiful city, Sakura commented offhandedly. The architecture is absolutely gorgeous. Definitely, Naruto mentioned with a small smile, eyes now open and roaming across the city from his seat. Kinda surprised that the people here speak our language. It's not our language, Sasuke commented. It's incredibly similar but some words don't match. I noticed it while trying to read the menu. Half of it is literally unintelligible. Naruto glanced back down at the menu before frowning. Now that he was actually looking at it instead of skimming over it he could see what Sasuke was saying. He only recognized the misu because of the picture. Ah, I guess we have to learn a new language. We have to learn a lot of things. Sakura added. You heard what Ophis said. There are other factions here. Even gods. Actual divinity. We're in enemy territory with absolutely zero information. A frown marred Sasuke's face. A shinobi's worst nightmare. He muttered quietly. I think we'll be okay. The Kayubi Jinchuriki or rather. Multiple Biju Jinchuriki piped up. We're strong and we got each other. That's all that matters, right? A smile formed on Sakura's face as she responded. I'll drink to that. Sasuke did not respond but he did have a smirk upon his face and that was as close to an acceptance as they'd get. Here you go. The white-haired waitress interrupted. She placed three separate bowls and plates on the table before bowing her head. Enjoy. She disappeared towards the back of the restaurant afterwards. Delicious. Not as good as Ichiraku's though. Nothing will be better than that. The standards are too high. Sasuke commented. I recall you going there by yourself at times, Sasuke. The ebony-haired teen shrugged his shoulders at Sakura's statement. Ramen isn't my favorite dish but they did know how to cook. It helped that their onigiri was amazing as well. Couldn't go wrong with Ichiraku's. Never thought I'd hear the almighty Uchiha Avenger praise Ichiraku. The world must be ending. Naruto commented between slurps. Well, it kind of did. Idiot. The Avenger reminded with a raised eyebrow, gingerly sipping on his soup. Still sad about that one. Naruto commented with a slightly downtrodden expression. There's nothing wrong with that, the medic said with compassion. Yeah, unless you're a little pussy. Sasuke quipped with a side-eyed glance at Naruto. It had the expected outcome of angering Naruto. Fuck you. Oh, I'm sorry. Sasuke feigned hearing as he placed his right hand up to his ear. Did I hear a pussy crying? The blonde teen immediately launched a punch towards Sasuke who took the blow and rolled. The blonde teen immediately chased after him. Sakura just sighed quietly and ate her dumplings, ignoring the two children she called teammates. Fucking idiots. Team 7 idly walked through the city of Kyoto after finishing their meal. Sasuke and Naruto had fought like the children they were and Sakura had drank like the aunt she wished to be. Kakashi is here, Naruto mentioned off-handedly. Not a second later did the masked Jonin land behind his team, face buried in a small white book. That's why you decided to go by yourself. Sakura states with a twitching eyebrow so you could buy your stupid porn. It isn't stupid, Sakura, 
It is art. An uncultured swine such as yourself wouldn't understand. Kakashi replied in an upbeat manner. Before Sakura could punch the Jonin through fifteen buildings they were finally stopped by a woman who possessed a wolf's tail and ears. Odd. It seemed to entire city went silent. Sasuke's eyes roamed along the streets and noticed the lack of people and activity. Interesting. The wolf woman was then joined by another dozen yukai. They surrounded Team 7 but their stances leaned on being friendly instead of hostile. Which was a good call for them. Because if they wanted to be hostile then Sasuke would give them hostile. He was always ready. H. Halt. Please state your business in K. Kyoto. The young woman demanded nervously. Naruto offered a small wave with a smile. Yo. It seemed to only make the woman even more nervous. Her shoulders trembled nervously as her gaze swept through the group multiple times. Do you work for Yusaka? Naruto questioned in a friendly manner. If so, we have no problem meeting her. My name is Naruto Uzumaki. Following his greeting Naruto grinned widely before pointing to each of his teammates and naming them off. This asshole is Sasuke Uchiha. The aforementioned Uchiha just stared blankly at the wolf woman. Not bothering to actually greet her in the slightest. That's Sakura Haruno. She's really violent. Naruto was immediately punched through 17 buildings following his accusation. The group of Yukai were immediately horrified. They hadn't even seen the girl move. I'm not violent. The pink-haired medic raged on with a clenched fist. Not a moment later did Naruto reappear in his previous spot, only this time with a healthy black eye, and introduced the last member of Team 7. That's Kakashi Hataki. He likes porn. The masked man raised two fingers in greeting before replying, face still in his tiny hentai manga. You're damn right I do. Silence. An awkward silence at least for the group of Yukai. Uh. The wolf woman eloquently managed. Anyway. Naruto loudly declared while clapping his hands. Are you going to take us to Yusaka now? I hear she's the leader of this city and that she's really strong. Aye aye. Es suppose. The woman answered. Well, what are we waiting for? Naruto replied with a loud chuckle. He set off in a slow march towards a random direction. A hey, actually, that isn't the way. She trailed off once the teen you turned. The boy was now apparently heading in the exact direction he was supposed to be. H how did yo? Don't bother. Sasuke interrupted with a quiet grunt, immediately matching his friend's pace. Sakura and Kakashi shrugged their shoulders before following after the Uchiha, not bothering to wait for the wolf Yukai to speak. Several seconds passed by in silence as the group of Yukai tried to process what had happened. It took longer than they would have liked but eventually the wolf Yukai snapped to attention. H hey. W wait. I'm supposed to be leading you. What? She immediately ran off towards the group of shinobi, wolf tail flopping behind her. The other yukai just looked at one another in confusion before shaking their heads and following after their group leader. Why? The wolf yukai finally reached the blonde teen as she huffed in a tired fashion. How the hell had they managed to get this far by walking? Asuna had been running after them the entire time. What the hell were these humans? I I. I'm supposed. Supposed to lead you. Her hands rested on her knees as she exhaled heavily. Holy shit. How are you so fast? I am speed. Naruto replied with a cheeky smile. I have no idea what that means. The wolf Yukai responded with furrowed eyebrows. She was silent before getting her breathing under control and offering the group a nervous smile. F follow me, please. She immediately began to lead the group after her words with Team 7 reluctantly following. Great. Sasuke muttered under his breath. She's an idiot too. Adina's wolf-like ears lowered down onto her head in a pitiful manner. A small frown graced her face at the boy's harsh words. Nay, Sasuke. Don't be an asshole. I think she's cute. Naruto commented with a small smile. The blonde teen's compliment made the wolf Yukai blush in embarrassment. You think everything that's stupid is cute? Sasuke replied snidely. Again, the poor Yukai's ears lay flat against her head. What's your name? The pink-haired shinobi asked as she lightly. Read harshly, elbowed her teammates in the ribs. Oh, uh, M. My name is Asuna. I'm one of Lady Yusaka's guards. She replied in a timid fashion. You're a shitty guard. Sasuke insulted near instantaneously. Sasuke. Naruto hissed quietly. The ebony haired teen turned towards his friend before rolling his eyes. Fine. He'd play nice. You're less than shitty. The Uchiha corrected. Wah. Why are you such a bully? Asuna wailed as tears fell down her face. Great. Now the idiot was crying. Splendid. You really do hate women don't ya, ya bastard. The blonde teen remarked, watching the crying wolf Yukai lead them to Yusaka's manor. I hate dumb women, he corrected with an indignant sniff. Kakashi chimed in from the back of the group. No, 
You hate women. He's an insult. Naruto insulted with a mocking grin. Listen, idiot. You don't even know what that word means. The Avenger accused in annoyance. Do too. Do not. Sakura grunted in annoyance before speaking. Just fucking kiss already. A small smirk immediately formed in her face as the two teens pulled away from each other in disgust. Easy. The group of Yukai and Shinobi traveled for another hour or so before finally reaching the manor of Lady Yusaka. It was a rather beautiful and large compound, surrounded by this world's Japanese architect. There were several cherry blossom trees in the courtyard of the compound with several koi ponds and a large man-made lake in the center of the compound's entrance. Every single individual they passed was a yukai in disguise and each individual graced Team 7 with suspicion in their eyes. As they continued to travel in the large compound, Naruto spoke with curiosity lacing his voice. So, how many yukai live in Kyoto? Asuna jumped lightly from the question before answering quietly. Uh, a lot. Doesn't really help but I guess it works. The blonde responded with a minor shrug of the shoulders. The group descended into silence following Naruto's comment. Asuna continued to lead the shinobi to her leader, passing by several yukai who were quite powerful. Just not as powerful as the woman Naruto could sense. They took several twists and turns in the compound before finally reaching a hallway with a single door situated at the end. Asuna led the group down the lengthy hallway before pausing at the door and knocking politely. A melodic voice resounded from the other side of the door, likely Yusaka's, and granted them permission to enter. Asuna placed one hand on the door before sliding it to the right. She led the shinobi into the room before stopping at the large table situated in the middle of the room. Naruto could not see the woman, since she was sitting in the farmost chair at the table with her back turned, but he could sense her. The room was more like an office or meeting room, if anything. There were multiple chairs situated on the sides of the table with multiple portraits hanging in the wall. Naruto assumed that these portraits were of either past leaders or gods that they worshipped. I have brought them here like you asked Lady Yusaka. Asuna bowed low to her leader, awaiting her next order. Team 7 stood quietly, able to sense the power the woman held. It was quite impressive. She could have gave one of the weaker cage a run for their money. That is all, Asuna-chan. Please, leave us, Yusaka ordered politely. The white-haired Yukai was hesitant for a mere moment before bowing once more and leaving the room. After Asuna's exit, the room grew quiet. Team 7 did not speak and Yusaka did not address them. This went on for an entire minute before the woman's chair shifted. Beautiful locks of blonde hair were revealed first followed by the form of an absolutely divine-looking woman. She possessed thin eyebrows not unlike Kagaya Otsutsuki with delicate features. The woman wore a yellow kimono, wrapped by a golden obi. A black pelt with gold skulls and lines hung off her dainty shoulders. Her yellow kimono was open and revealed the woman's rather, gigantic breasts. A gentle smile formed on her face before nine golden yellow tails fluttered out from behind her, lazily swaying to and fro. A set of fox ears slowly twitched atop her head, topping off the form of this beautiful creature. Hello. Welcome to Kyoto. My name is Yusaka, leader of the Kyoto Yukai faction. Her head tilted with a small smile as she placed her hands together in front of her. Naruto's eyes widened greatly as he stared at the woman. Words failed to reach him and for the first time in his life he was absolutely captivated by the beauty of a woman. Dot dot dot. Dot dot dot. Dot dot dot. Holy shit. You're beautiful. And your breasts are gigantic. The words escaped Naruto before he could even hope to stop them. A blush exploded onto his face and he immediately covered his face. It didn't help that his teammates were now openly laughing at him. Fucking traitors. It wasn't his fault. This woman was practically a goddess. The blonde-haired woman seemed surprised for a mere moment before laughter escaped her. It was a beautiful laugh, Naruto thought. Oh my, how bold of you. I do not even know your name yet, child. An amused smile formed on Yusaka's face as she watched the blonde teen squirm. Air. I uh, Naruto coughed into his left hand before speaking again. I'm Naruto Uzumaki. Naruto. Uzumaki. Yusaka repeated the boy's name in her head. It had a nice ring to it. Oh yes, she was going to enjoy this conversation. Yusaka had always thought that humans were an interesting bunch. Their very existence defied logic and reasoning. The human race had always been written off as a non-lethal, faction. Humans were fragile, terribly so. Angels, devils, and even gods had made that abundantly clear millennia after millennia. Oh yes, there were the odd times where a normal human reached the proverbial top of the food chain and cemented themselves in history forever. Jesus Christ, Achilles, Hachiman, Oda Nobunaga. 
Men like them had possessed power that threatened the supernatural. They were feared. Feared. What humans lacked in power they more than made up through sheer tenacity, ingenuity and grit. Yusaka had even found herself being wary and cautious around humans. Especially when those humans in question could wield sacred gears. God had gave humans a chance to fight back against those that wished to oppress them. But those humans of old paled in comparison to the four humans that stood before her right now. Yusaka was a young Kayubi. Barely three centuries old at that. She had seen powerful humans come and go during her time but none could even hold a candle to the four humans that stood in front of her. The weakest of their little quartet, that being the tall and lanky man with silver hair, made the hairs on the back of her neck stick on edge. He lacked the sheer reserves that the younger teens held but that mattered little. His reserves rivaled her own. What he lacked in sheer firepower was more than made up by his experience. Those charcoal eyes of his carried an extreme weight to them. He had seen horrors that would drive a lesser man to the brink of insanity. He was grit personified. Tenacious. Raised on war. All of them had been raised in war. It was hard not to miss it. That gleam in their eyes, the tense shoulders, their wandering eyes. They had been taught that everything and everyone could and would kill you. Yusaka would have shaken her head had she not wanted to keep appearances up. It saddened her. Saddened her to know that children, who were barely older than her own Kuno-chan, could be dragged into conflict that threatened their very own existence. All on the whims of men and women who possessed power that they should not have. This time, Yusaka did shake her head with a rueful sigh. She always had been an emotional woman. To not feel empathy, even to those who were strangers, was cruel. She did not know these humans and yet she still felt saddened to know that war had taken their innocence. Yusaka had done everything in her power to keep the Yukai in Kyoto from bickering. She didn't wish for Kuno, or any child for that matter, to grow up with pain. With anger. With hate. That was all war did. Cause pain. Cause anger. Cause hate. Unfortunately, war was an endless cycle. Yusaka could only pray to the Kamis above that it had yet to affect the Yukai. And if war were to strike the Yukai, then Yusaka would do everything in her power to protect her people. Even if it meant that she would die doing so, are you okay? Yusaka's train of thought was interrupted by the very same blonde child who had complimented her earlier. Where those once bright blue eyes had been filled with awe and appreciation, they were now filled with genuine concern. A gentle smile replaced her previously downtrodden one as she waved the teen off, appreciating his concern. Oh, I'm quite alright. Just a few unpleasant thoughts is all. Yusaka's nine fluffy tails waved in the air slowly before she gestured with her hand. If you would, please sit. I have a myriad of questions and I believe you have answers. Two of the humans sat down, the blonde teen and the pink-haired teen, but the other two males refused. The older man was content with standing, one hand shoved into his pocket. Swiveling her gaze to the other teen, she noticed that while not outright trying to disrespect her, he seemed to forego sitting in favor of leaning on the wall behind his fellow humans. There was also something curious about that purple eye of his. It was not uncomfortable to look at but its very presence seemed to pull her in. Yusaka stood for several seconds before taking her own seat and placing her hands in her lap. Her ears twitched as she continued to smile beatifically. Well, if you are all comfortable then let's begin. She placed her hands onto the table, interlocking her fingers together. As I have said before, I am Yusaka and I am the leader of the Yukai faction in Kyoto. I oversee the supernatural side of things on this quadrant of Japan. When my subordinates informed me that four incredibly powerful humans had stepped into our city, I was curious. You four are not only powerful but you wield chakra to boot. I find myself intrigued by your very presence. Please, enlighten me. She beckoned with a titled head, eyes narrowed in genuine curiosity. She watched the four individuals trade looks with one another. They did not even speak, only using their eyes. This went on for several seconds before they all seemed to come to an agreement. Oh that. Yeah. We're not from this world. A dragon named Ophis saved us and then dropped us off here in Kyoto. Pretty cool, huh? Naruto spoke with an easy smile. Naruto. The pink-haired girl hissed as her head turned towards the teen. You're such an idiot. The ebony-haired teen spoke while sighing quietly, expression bordering on disdain and genuine annoyance. A sigh rang out from the older man of the quartet but he did not seem surprised or annoyed like his other two compatriots. The man seemed to have expected the blonde's answer. Why are you too surprised? He questioned while returning his gaze to his little white book. Subtly isn't Naruto's M.O. Come on, Kakai-sensei. I'm not that bad. Naruto complained with a frown. The lanky man offered an eye smile as he responded. True. You're worse than bad. Awful is a better term. 
Naruto just sulked. Did, did you just say Ophis? The quartet centered their attention on the attractive Yukai. Her eyes were widened to a degree that was almost painful and they noticed the slight trembles that shook her body. Uh, yeah. Naruto answered while rubbing the back of his head with a sheepish smile. She also inadvertently destroyed our homeworld. He finished with a smile that made him seem almost constipated. Yusaka's eyes only seemed to grow bigger at the answer. Your world? Destroyed? She? The ebony-haired teen with dual-colored pupils answered her with a suffering sigh. Yes, our world. We aren't from this one. Yes, again, Ophis inadvertently destroyed our world when she traveled to it in the dimensional gap. And, once again, yes. Ophis is a woman. Dragon. Woman dragon. Thing. He finished with a slightly confused expression. She said she was able to shape-shift at will. The silver-haired man supplied helpfully. Yeah, we don't really know how she does it. Naruto answered while rubbing her chin. Did he just ignore his ally? Shapeshifter. The man answered once more, eyes still buried in his pornographic book. We'll have to ask her next time, Naruto. The pink-haired female spoke out, completely ignoring the older man's answer. Cool. Ignored again. The lanky man commented lackadaisically. Yusaka was silent as she listened to the four individuals speak amongst themselves. This was. Dangerous. These four individuals, who rivaled even the Shinto gods, had quite literally landed on her doorstep. By Ophis, the infinite dragon god, no less. Dangerous because these four individuals were insanely powerful. She held her doubts on being able to defeat even the weakest individual in their little group. She didn't even know their names, they just dropped a bombshell before even providing their names. Yusaka was going to end up having a headache after this. Or perhaps this little meeting was a blessing in disguise. She could take advantage of this situation. Four incredibly powerful individuals, who had no knowledge of this world other than the minor information they may have gotten from Ophis, were speaking with her. The leader of the Yukai faction in Kyoto, who answered directly to the big three of the Shinto pantheon. Yes. Yes yes yes. She could make this work. A coy smile formed on her face as she placed her left elbow on the table. Cupping her chin on the palm of her resting arm, she directed a half-lidded gaze on the supposed leader of their group. I apologize but I didn't quite catch all your names. When the quartet stopped talking, Yusaka continued speaking. I would be a terrible leader if I didn't give you the respect you deserve. She immediately noticed how their eyes narrowed, almost as if they were dissecting her words and breaking down their motive. It was honestly frightening how they could go from carefree friends with history to stone-cold killers ready for war. What past did these four have? Well, I'm Naruto Uzumaki. Though, I already introduced myself when I... He coughed into his remaining hand with a dash of red staining his cheeks. It was too cute. What an adorable boy. She could just eat him up. In fact, she just my down girl. Behave. Yusaka curbed those thoughts with an amused smile and proceeded to wink at the teen. He flustered for a bit before eventually squaring his shoulders and gesturing towards one of his friends. Sasuke Uchiha. The now-named ebony-haired teen stated, Eyes sharper than steel gazed at her, breaking her down inch by inch. What a frightening stare he possessed. Yusaka offered the teen a simple nod, which was not returned, and glanced to the next individual. Hello. My name is Sakura Haruno. The pink-haired female introduced with a smile. Sorry for my teammates, they can be really troublesome, and annoying. The Yukai leader offered the girl a smile filled with mirth as she replied. As troublesome as nearly destroying 17 buildings? The girl faltered for a moment before bowing at the hip and apologizing. I'm sorry for that. Uh, yeah. She finished awkwardly as she rose to her full height. Yusaka's smile grew larger as she waved off the girl's apology. It is fine. No one was hurt. Though, I'm sure the Yukai would not mind a helping hand. Sakura immediately understood the underlying comment and offered the Kayubi a single nod. Maybe she shouldn't have punched Naruto. Or maybe she should punch him more? That sounded better. The last individual of their group closed his book and placed it into his unique-looking vest. He placed his left hand into his pocket and shifted on his heel. I'm Kakashi Hitaki. Offering the woman an eye smile, he continued, and I lead these little gremlins, they're my students. An annoyed scoff resounded from Sasuke as he crossed his arms, you're not our sensei anymore. Rude. The lanky man replied half-heartedly. Sasuke wasn't necessarily wrong with his statement, he wasn't their sensei anymore nor did he lead them. I still think of you as a sensei. Naruto piped up with a smile. Kakashi offered the boy a two-finger salute before reaching back into his vest and procuring his book. You don't have to be a dick, Sasuke. Sakura responded while rolling her eyes. I don't have to be a lot of things, he replied while closing his eyes, still doesn't change the fact that I'm right. 
Yasaka observed the group as they bickered with one another like children. They insulted, jabbed and prodded at one another's nerves with the skill they had honed from years of being together. It was a rather amusing and interesting sight to see. Though their words seemed to not truly affect one another, she'd rather they not fight in her office. She cleared her throat quietly, internally pleased that the group of other worldly shinobi had ceased insulting one another. Well, it appears that fate has smiled on you for. Yusaka offered the four teens a small smile as she gestured towards them. If you would like, perhaps you could call Kyoto your new home? There. She threw her offer in. These four humans were unique and powerful and while not necessarily Yukai, it didn't mean they couldn't aid in defending Kyoto if danger reared its ugly head. After all, she had already had a troubling run-in with a group of humans a few weeks ago. They were powerful and boasted several unique sacred gears with even a few Longinus at their disposal. It was only after blindsiding one of their weaker members and killing them, was she able to escape. It helped that she had activated the ley lines, fighting them off while also retreating to safety. Activating the ley lines had alerted Amaterasu which brought the wrath of the big three upon the humans who had dared to step foot in Kyoto. Yusaka was sure that they'd come back though. They had retreated just as easily as they had come in the whole of Kyoto had and was still on alert from the surprise attack. Those humans clearly wanted something. Whatever it was though, Yusaka did not know. To attack the leader of a faction that worked directly under the Shinto Pathion site was nothing short of suicidal. Humans always were an ambitious sort. I think I speak for all of us when I say that we would be honored to call Kyoto our home. Naruto spoke up, interrupting Yusaka's internal thoughts. But at the same time, he glanced towards his friends with a minor frown and did not continue. The boy's pause caused a small frown to form on Yusaka's face. Is there something troubling you? I can't say that I can even hope to understand the pain that you've gone through regarding losing your entire home and world, but if I am able to aid where I can then I will. Naruto's eyes shifted towards the woman before he sighed quietly. Let's be honest here. We're powerful. He gestured to his best friend and teammates. You and Ophis have spoken of other factions and while I'm not the arrogant type, I'd rather not cause problems and stay a lot more off the grid. An annoyed scoff resounded from beside Naruto. You're going to be the one who gets us discovered. You don't even know what subtly is. Idiot. Shut up. I can be subtle. Naruto refuted with an annoyed scowl. Yes and I can be nice. The Uchiha snarked back with a smug smirk. The second you see some random yukai in trouble you're going to toss around a dozen rosin shuriken and bring the might of every faction that exists on this planet on our heads. Naruto raised a finger in defiance, ready to refute Sasuke's words. He's not wrong, Naruto. Kakashi piped up, eyes glued to his porn. It may not necessarily be bad or anything of the sort but sooner or later this world will find out about us. We are not weak. Far from it. The lanky man stopped reading his book, closing it and tucking it into his flak jacket. His eyes were sharp as he gazed at his former student. It only takes one incident, whether it be positive or negative, for this world's supernatural beings to notice us. And who knows? Perhaps they are already aware of us. Who can say? He shrugged his shoulders before continuing. This world isn't the same as ours. If you step on someone's toes and they take offense, you and us will paint a target on the whole of Kyoto and even the Shinto pantheon. Getting his point across, Kakashi crossed his arms against his chest before leaning back against the wall. This decision isn't to be made lightly. There are clearly positives and negatives, housing and information as an example. He closed his eyes before finally finishing. I don't mind taking up Yusaka Sama's offer. We certainly have our options but who's to say that the other factions will even accept us? Perhaps they'll see a threat and hope to strike us down. TCH. Sasuke scoffed with a sneer. They can try. Now's not the time Sasuke. Sakura finally spoke with furrowed brows. We really can't risk angering these unknown groups when we know nothing about them. The Uchiha sighed quietly but ultimately nodded his head at the girl's statement. Sakura wasn't wrong. There were only four of them and while they were far from weak, Sasuke didn't necessarily fancy his odds against multiple groups of powerful beings and gods. Kagaya was difficult enough. It would only take a handful of beings like her to bring them down. He hadn't survived for as long as he had just to throw it away due to misguided pride. All the more reason to take her offer. Kakashi stated, I, for one, would not mind a soft bed and miso soup. Naruto was silent for a few moments before inevitably shrugging his shoulders with a smile. I was really only hesitating because I was thinking of you guys. I want what's best for us. And if you guys think that this is our best option then I'm all for it. Might as well. What do have to lose at this point? Sasuke shrugged nonchalantly while leaning against the wall behind him. I can't wait to have an actual shower again. Sakura squealed happily. Kakashi said nothing but did give a thumbs up with an eye smile. Seeing that all of his friends had no problem with the decision, 
Naruto turned towards the leader of the Yukai faction and offered her a large grin. Team 7 would be honored to call Kyoto and by extension, the Shinto Pantheon, our home. He bowed his head in thanks before rising. Thank you, Yusaka sama The Kayubi just offered the boy a beautiful and gentle smile. When you four have settled in, we can continue discussions and terms at a later date. For now. Whatever Yusaka was about to say was interrupted by a wave of powerful energy. A heavy weight settled upon her shoulders followed by a brilliant flash of white light. Her eyes widened and she immediately cast a golden barrier in the room, protecting it from the inevitable explosion that would soon follow. Just as she had predicted, an explosion of fire engulfed the building. Her ears rang as she clenched her eyes shut and she blacked out for a mere moment. Several seconds passed by in silence before Yusaka slowly opened her eyes. Her golden orbs widened in shock when she noticed that she was in a purple cage of some sort. Not a cage. Upon further inspection, she noticed that this cage possessed similar features to that of a human. Equipped with a torso, arms, and head. What? What was this power? You okay? Yusaka jumped slightly upon hearing Sasuke's voice. Why did her knees hurt? Why did she feel dizzy? Her head was absolutely pounding. I got you. The teen stated quietly, arm wrapping around the woman's waist and shouldering most of her weight. Your barrier held most of the explosion but it gave way eventually. Whatever or whoever just attacked, is going to regret it. Yusaka blinked several times in confusion before shaking her head and coughing quietly. Wait. Sasuke did not wait. The teen placed the leader of Kyoto against a pile of rubble before turning his attention to the sky. The boy muttered something unintelligible and not a second later did a carbon copy clone of the teen appear. The two Sasukes stared at one another for a single second before the real one, Yusaka suspected at least, took off into the sky. What was going on? She had felt Amaterasu's power surge before. Before. Yusaka's eyes widened once more as she tried to stand up. Her left leg buckled beneath her and she fell with a soft cry of pain. You should stay put. The doppelganger of Sasuke spoke quietly. It took a knee beside her before green chakra appeared on his palms. He placed his hands near her legs and a soothing comfort soon followed. We have this covered. Yusaka tried to speak. She really truly did. But that attack had drained her reserves. She couldn't even think straight. Why had Amaterasu just attacked? It didn't make sense. Could she believe that these humans were a threat? An ugly thought reared its head as she thought about it. This was a misunderstanding. She needed to speak. But. But her eyes were heavy. And whatever this clone was doing was heavenly. Maybe. Maybe she could sleep for a minute or two. And with those final thoughts, Yusaka's eyes slowly closed. Her body relaxed and her head drooped. The clone of Sasuke stared at the unconscious woman for a second before his right hand traveled towards her head. He gently turned the woman's head, eyeing the rather nasty wound on the side of her head. The clone shook its head before gathering more chakra and healing the wound. The clone's mismatched orbs traveled towards the sky, spotting its creator and Naruto, fighting two powerful individuals. Not more than a day and we've already encountered gods. What shitty luck? The clone thought quietly. Sasuke's Suzanoo slowly deconstructed as he stared at a regal-looking man, floating with zero problem in the sky. The armor of his Suzanoo slowly disappeared, followed by the head and legs. The only thing remaining were the wings of his Suzanoo, granting him flight. Mangekio Sharingan spinning in his right eye and Rinnegan flaring in his left eye, Sasuke stared at the man that stood several meters in front of him. He could sense the man's power and it was nothing to scoff at. The man was suppressing most of it but Sasuke could easily sense it. This man was a god. Likely a Shinto god at that, considering his wardrobe and traditional blade. The man was dressed in a baby blue kimono that revealed his muscular torso and toned arms. He wore black hakama pants that were embroidered with designs that were reminiscent of waves. He wore a pair of simple sandals, held together by a thin piece of twine. His blade was sheathed on his left hip and he wore a straw hat atop his head, hiding his ebony locks of hair that were pulled into an elegant ponytail. Who are you? Sasuke asked quietly, right hand resting on his blade. The unknown man regarded Sasuke for a moment before he too placed his hands on his blade. His left hand grasped his sheath as his right hand gripped its handle. It is rude to not introduce yourself first. His voice was deep and carried a harsh undertone to it. You are an intruder. But I am a humble man. I will tell you my name before eradicating you. In the blink of an eye the man's power skyrocketed. The skies darkened almost immediately, dozens of rumbling clouds following shortly after. Another second passed by before the distinct sound of thunder clapped through the sky. Several lightning strikes descended upon Kyoto, lighting up the sky and illuminating it brightly. And when he spoke, the storm screamed. I am Suzanoo no Makoto. 
younger brother to Amaterasu Omikami and Sukuyomi no Makoto, I am the Shinto god of the storms and sea. The now named god unsheathed his blade before slowly taking a stance, and I am your end. Sasuke's body tensed and not a second later did Suzanoo appear directly in front of him with his blade poised to sever Sasuke's head. The teen sneered as his own blade intercepted the gods causing a tower of sparks to emanate from the action. The god seemed almost surprised if the slight widening of his eyes was anything to go by. I don't care who you are. If you want a fight then I'll deliver unto you a slaughter. Sasuke's Mangekyo Sharingan spun ferociously before a torrent of black fire spewed at the Japanese kami. The kami, upon seeing his opponent's unique red eye spin, disappeared in the blink of an eye. The distinct sound of thunder following his retreat as he did so. Reappearing a short distance away, the Shinto kami eyed the human warily. His gray eyes regarded the teen for a moment before he placed the palm of his left hand against the flat end of his blade. Suzanoo closed his eyes and swept his hand along the divine steel of his kusanagi. A crack of lightning resounded out into the sky, rumbling angrily for but a moment. A gigantic cumulonimbus formed directly above Suzanoo before lightning descended directly upon the man's sword, illuminating the blade with pure, raw lightning. Suzanoo stared at his glowing kusanagi for a moment before raising his eyes to the human who dared to tread upon his home. You, boy. What is your name? Suzanoo bent low at the knees before slowly and carefully sheathing his blade in the raw lightning that encompassed it. He took up a rather simple Iido stance as he stared at Sasuke. Sasuke eyed the man with a glare before glancing up towards the sky. His mismatched orbs traveled along the darkened clouds before flipping his kusanagi in a reverse grip. The cry of a thousand birds sang from his right hand before being engulfed by Raiden Chakra. The lightning emanating from his hand barked loudly, piercing the heavens and drowning out Suzanoo's own thunder. A gigantic creature of pure lightning formed from the clouds, lighting up the entirety of Kyoto. The creature of pure lightning dwarfed the clouds that it originally had been created from and cast its own shadow on the city. Suzanoo stared at the lightning creature with widened eyes, sensing the monstrous amount of chakra that was used to create the beast. The gigantic lightning creature bellowed a mighty roar, its red eyes swaying to and fro before setting its sight upon Suzanoo. Upon recognizing its enemy it released yet another roar, piercing the heavens. My name is Sasuke Uchiha. The teen tilted his head, expression bordering on disdain as he stared at Suzanoo, and you, vanish with the roar of thunder. Sasuke raised his right hand into the air before bringing it down and uttering a single word. Kirin. And the sky turned white. Naruto's enhanced eyes strayed towards the giant clouds resting above Kyoto with a minor frown. Sasuke was fighting some unknown man, definitely a god by the output of power, and were fighting several miles off the outskirts of Kyoto. His unique eyes, no longer the cerulean they once were, swiveled to the opposite direction. He sensed Kakashi and Sakura fighting with another being that was on par with the one Sasuke was fighting. Golden yellow eyes, equipped with a horizontal bar and an animalistic slit through the center, slowly focused on the rather beautiful woman floating not but ten meters from him. Soft, delicate features settled in a scowl stared back at him. She had her black hair pulled into an elegant ponytail that flowed down her back. She wore a traditional Miko outfit with simple sandals held together by a thin piece of twine. On the woman's left hip was a beautiful ornate scabbard. Sheathed in said scabbard was a katana that practically reeked of divine essence. The most interesting thing about the woman was the unique looking shield that floated behind her. It was no bigger than an ordinary plate that one would eat food off of. The side that Naruto could see glowed with an ethereal energy that he couldn't quite understand. Staring at the shield was like staring directly at the sun. Naruto was silent for a moment before feeling. Something prick his sixth sense. It wasn't necessarily bad but. Distracting. Like someone trying to get his attention. Focus Naruto. Kurama's deep voice reminded. We will deal with whatever that is later. Though, I have a feeling it will only cause problems at a later date. It feels. Ancient. Naruto mentally replied. Eyes still staring at the powerful woman in front of him. But you're right. We can worry about it some other time. For now, let's focus on this woman. The blonde teen squared his shoulders before furrowing his eyebrows. Who are you? And why did you attack us? The regal-looking woman seemed to only get angrier. Her lips thinned in displeasure as her expression tightened. You dare tread upon the soil of my home again? The woman snarled angrily. I will send you to Yomi. Naruto's eyes widened as the woman's power skyrocketed. His senses screamed and not a second later did he duck. Golden eyes blazed as he stared at the woman from his crouched position. His fist cracked out against her stomach nearly folding her over it as he sent her careening through the sky, nearly crashing through a building due to the force of his attack. Hey, he snarled angrily, 
I don't want to fight you but if have to, I will. Naruto stared down at the woman, watching as she slowly stood to her feet. Her gray eyes were a flurry of emotion before eventually going blank. The blonde teen had only a second to move as she appeared in front of him once again. Only this time, the woman's blade shined as bright as the sun. And when she swung, Naruto's eyes widened as the sky itself erupted into fire. White hot flames emanated from the woman's blade, spanning out several kilometers in size. The flames only seemed to multiply as Naruto continued his hasty retreat. Sun Goku. Naruto cried out. You oosh, I am fired up. The Yanbi roared out in response to Naruto. The blonde Jinchuriki skid to a stop in midair as his arm became encased in pure lava before he reared the appendage back. Yotan. Kyojin Kazanryu no Jutsu. A dragon made of pure magma, molten rock and lava formed from his action. The giant construct of chakra was nearly the same size as Kurama as it emerged from the mountain of lava that Naruto produced. The beast roared loudly as its red eyes focused on the proverbial wall of flames heading towards its creator. The mighty dragon unfurled its massive wings and roared once more. It immediately charged into the sea of flames, engulfing it whole before exploding. An incredibly powerful shockwave detonated through the heavens as the jutsu swallowed the divine flames whole. You. Naruto heard the woman speak softly. Who are you, child? Her tone lacked much of the anger it once previously held but there were still tinges of it. Naruto shook his left arm, ridding it of the lava that had previously encased it. My name is Naruto Uzumaki. His body became engulfed in a cloak of golden chakra, unique designs appearing on his torso and arms. Seven pitch black orbs formed behind him and began to spin in a hypnotic fashion. One of the orbs left its formation and formed into a thin staff. The blonde teen grabbed the Gudadama and twirled it before resting it against his shoulder. The real question here is, who are you? Golden, slitted eyes hardened as Naruto pinned the powerful woman with a glare. You just attacked my friends and I. We haven't done anything to warrant such actions. The woman's eyes narrowed dangerously as she slowly floated back into the sky, her unique floating shield spinning. Who am I? She replied angrily. I am Amaterasu Omikami, leader of the Shinto pantheon protector of Japan and all its inhabitants. The woman gripped her blade with white knuckles as she spoke once more. You dare attack my home not once, but twice, and then have the gall to question me? Amaterasu's entire being seemed to just shine. Power radiated from every single one of her pores as she reared her arm back to swing her blade. You will suffer for your transgressions against my home. Before Amaterasu could swing her blade, an indescribable amount of pain erupted from her stomach, Spittle launched from her mouth and then her world flipped upside down. She blinked once before pain struck her body once more. Her vision went white and the feeling of weightlessness washed over her. A bright light imploded on her being, racking her body. Her eyes rang and her head hurt. And then she did something that she regretted. Amaterasu opened her eyes. Pain. Pain 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 pain. Make it stop oh god I thirts. She cried out loudly as a searing pain flashed across her belly, spreading out to every inch of her body. It felt like hundreds of thousands of needles were ripping and tearing her very being apart. The pain continued for what felt like millennia as her stomach was practically grinded away by the unseen assault on her body. What is this? This pain. Make it stop. Stop it. The goddess had only half a second to comprehend what was happening before her vision went black. Naruto caught the woman's body before it could fall to the earth, frown marring his face. He stared down at the god for a moment before he glanced towards the wound he caused. His rosin shuriken had done quite the number on her. Angry scorch marks marred her torso and stomach, blood seeping through her beautiful Miko outfit. Naruto sighed quietly before hefting the woman with his single arm. It was getting really annoying only having one arm. Without a second thought, his right arm seemed to materialize from thin air. Bone came first, then followed muscle. Veins soon came and went before being stitched together to form a tan arm and hand. Naruto hissed in minor pain as he shook his new arm and hand. Shit, that hurt. After assessing his new arm, he shifted Amaterasu's weight with a small sigh before glancing towards Sasuke's direction, sensing the monstrous amount of chakra he was producing. Where the sky had once been bright and illuminating, it was now dark, as if the sun had completely disappeared. The familiar roar of Kirin pierced the heavens and Naruto had a single second to glimpse at it. That was a very big Kirin, it almost rivaled the one that Sasuke had used against him. The next nanosecond, it descended upon Sasuke's opponent. Naruto shook his head quietly as the entire earth seemed to quake upon the release of Sasuke's jutsu. If the supernatural world was unaware of them before, then they most certainly were aware now. 
his eyes trailed back to Amaterasu and he gently floated back down onto the ground. He wasn't worried about his teammates, they could take care of themselves. They were strong. When Naruto's feet touched down upon Kyoto he gently laid Amaterasu on the ground, ignoring the Yukai who had hidden and fled to safety when the fighting broke out. He could sense the dozen or so Yukai that were watching his actions and he paid it little mind. He very much doubted that they would attack him. They clearly recognized their goddess but they also were aware of the difference of power. Amaterasu had clearly mistaken Team 7 for something else, it was the only explanation as to why she had chosen to attack first. This was Team 7's first time ever stepping foot in Kyoto. How would they have done it before? It just wasn't logical or accurate. Had Yusaka been attacked by powerful humans recently? Possibly. That or the unknown humans had attacked the gods themselves. Which would have been incredibly brazen of them. Naruto wasn't arrogant, far from it, but he was well aware of how strong he truly was. He could do so much with the power he held but his own morals and heart stayed his hand. He would always use this power to benefit others. Absolute power corrupts absolutely, he was well aware of this. To many individuals from his home had saw themselves as some sort of god. Nagato, Madara, Obito, Kagaya, Naruto swore to himself that he'd never be like them. He'd never let his power taint his thoughts and actions. Never. With those thoughts, Naruto placed his new hand on Amaterasu's stomach, the angry burn marks his Rosenshuriken produced began to slowly disappear from her stomach. Her expression tapered off into a pleased one and she seemed to almost lean into him. The Jinchuriki sighed quietly before his head turned towards Sakura and Kakashi's direction. He furrowed his brows for a moment before sensing the god they were fighting heading towards his direction. Kakashi and Sakura were fine, though a bit tired. It was to be expected really. They were fighting a real god after all. And while they were powerful, it'd be more a struggle to beat him. One Rosenshuriken? Naruto acknowledged his best friend's statement before slowly standing to his feet, hoisting Amaterasu up as he did so. He then positioned the woman's unconscious body on his back. I didn't want to take any chances, he finally replied, turning to Sasuke as he did so. She was powering up to release something. I didn't want her unleashing it. When he finally turned around, he took in Sasuke's appearance and raised a single eyebrow. Other than the slight singes on his body, he was relatively fine. And who's your new friend? He asked with an amused grin. The Uchiha rolled his eyes as he adjusted Suzanoo's body on his shoulder. The man's body was slightly charred and several spots on his clothes had been burned black. The man showed several signs of having been struck by lightning, and blood slowly dripped down several wounds on his body. This is Suzanoo. He's the younger brother of Amaterasu and Sukuyomi. His unique eyes shifted past Naruto as he stared at the direction that the other god was coming from. I assume that she's Amaterasu? Naruto sighed quietly before responding. Yeah, apparently she's the leader of the Shinto pantheon. We're so fucked. Peefed. Sasuke scoffed, adjusting Suzanoo with an annoyed grunt. If their most powerful gods are this weak then the Shinto pantheon has more things to worry about. Having one arm was really starting to piss him off. Noticing his friend's annoyance at carrying the male god, Naruto gestured with his free hand. You sure you don't want your arm back? The ebony-haired teen was silent for a moment before offering his severed limb to Naruto. Make it quick. Naruto smirked quietly before grabbing the boy's severed limb and pulsing his chakra. He took great pleasure in hearing Sasuke's grunt of pain as muscle, bone, and skin were recreated at the microscopic level. Fuck. That stings. Sasuke hissed quietly, shaking his new arm and hand. Don't be such a baby, Sasuke. You alive. Naruto replied with a smug grin. Fuck off. You first. Don't get suplexed. The fourth rakage already did that. Die. The Uchiha was about to lunge towards his friend before the last god finally appeared. His mismatched gaze focused on the regal looking man, noticing how tense the god was. Sasuke glanced towards Naruto and it seemed he had came to the same conclusion. The final god, Sukuyomi, possessed snow white hair that was held in a high ponytail. He wore a traditional black and white kimono, equipped with an elegant white haori. The god wore plain, white hakama pants and a pair of simple sandals that were held together by twine. Sukuyomi possessed a sharp chin like Suzanoo but had delicate features like his sister. Sukuyomi, I presume, Sasuke questioned as he stared at the man. He idly shifted the god atop his shoulder before sensing Kakashi and Sakura making their way towards their position. The white-haired god stared at Sasuke for a moment before dipping his head once. You. You are not the same humans that attacked Lady Yasaka. Naruto crossed his arms against his chest, chakra keeping Amaterasu glued to his back. Kyoto had already been attacked previously? The god nodded once. 
Then why attack us? The blonde questioned in confusion. Judging by the state of yourself and my teammates, you barely fought. Sukuyomi relaxed, if only slightly, and dipped his head. I knew you were not the same humans once Suzano fell. While powerful, those humans that had previously came were not nearly as strong as you. But, sister tends to rush in headfirst without thinking. She prefers action over words. The god looked almost embarrassed. Not for himself but for his sister. He seemed to be the most level-headed of the group at least. Naruto chuckled quietly. I tend to do the same so I can relate to that. Sasuke did not laugh. He scoffed, because you're an idiot. No you. That logic doesn't work. Does too. I'm going to kill you. False. While the two powerful males bickered and argued, Sukuyomi watched them with a tilted head. They reminded him of Amaterasu and Suzanoo. Those two always bickered. Little things, big things. It did not matter. They would argue and fight for hours upon hours. But at the end of the day they always seemed to make up. Such an odd relationship. It seemed these two possessed something similar to his siblings. Sukuyomi's gray eyes traveled away from the younger males and instead focused on the two individuals who appeared beside them. The same two humans he had briefly fought against. While these two were significantly weaker than the two males, they were still more than capable of standing up to him. It was a humbling moment for Sukuyomi. Well, more humbling for his siblings. He had always been an humble individual. More so than his family at least. Suzanoo was arrogant in nature and though he worked hard to control his powers it did not change the fact that he saw himself above others. This defeat would likely change him for the better. Or so Sukuyomi hoped. Amaterasu was not arrogant but she tended to use action first instead of words. It had always gotten them into trouble with other factions. The Shinto pantheon might not be one of the strongest pantheons but it was far from weak. Amaterasu tended to lash out at those who would disrespect their culture. Sukuyomi would feel slighted as well but violence begets violence. Force would not solve all problems, it usually led to mayhem. Mayhem led to grudges and grudges led to hate. Sukuyomi had lived for far too long to hold hate in his heart. His past and falling out with Amaterasu had cemented that. It was only after several centuries of never seeing his beloved sister again did he realize he had truly blundered when he killed Uke Mochi. It was a stain on his honor and while he had been disgusted by her actions, it did not merit her death. He had already begged for forgiveness. So, with a heavy heart and a gentle sigh, Sukuyomi bowed to the four humans in front of him and spoke quietly. I would ask for your forgiveness. My siblings and I do not wish for further violence between us. Let us talk instead. I beseech thee. The four humans regarded Sukuyomi with slight surprise. Though, the blonde one was the first to speak. Hey hey hey. No bowing. Uh, it was just a misunderstanding. It's all good. He released an awkward laugh before glancing towards his compatriots. Right guys? The two humans he had fought nodded their heads with small smiles. It happens. The silver-haired man stated lazily, hands in his pockets. It's okay. I tend to punch first, ask questions later anyway. The pink-haired female said with a laugh. Violent woman, that she was. The ebony-haired teen that defeated Suzanoo stared at the god for several seconds before sighing quietly. Whatever. He stated while turning towards the center of Kyoto. Let's get back to Yusaka. My clone healed her and she's asking questions. Nay, Sasuke-kun. Sakura cooed with an annoying grin. Trying to steal Naruto's woman? Does the bro code mean nothing to you? She ended her statement with a scandalous gasp. TCH. Sasuke scoffed but did not reply, choosing to ignore Sakura's bait. She's not my woman. Naruto cried indignantly, face red from embarrassment. But she will be. Kakashi piped up with unseen smile. She was practically displaying herself for you. Ah, to be young again. Shut up, stupid one-eyed bastard. The blonde muttered with an annoyed grunt. He disappeared shortly after in a yellow flash, leaving the group behind. Sensitive, no? Kakashi commented with a light-hearted chuckle. I think he likes her. The medic responded amusingly. Course he does. Her chest is bigger than his brain. Sasuke replied while shifting Susanoo on his shoulder. He's always had a thing for blonde women with big breasts. The Uchiha disappeared shortly after his statement, not waiting for anyone else's response. Sakura and Kakashi looked slightly surprised while Sukuyomi merely seemed confused. The remaining conscious god stared at the remaining humans before sighing quietly and shaking his head. These humans were incredibly odd. Again, I wish to apologize on behalf of the Kyoto faction and the Shinto pantheon. As the leader of this region and its people, I should set a better example. The ebony-haired goddess spoke, bowing at the hip. I ask for your forgiveness moving forward and hope that you accept Lady Yusaka's proposal. 
Team 7 stared at the bowing goddess in silence for several seconds before Naruto eventually spoke. He raised his hands in a placating manner before speaking. Air, it's fine. Really, it is. You don't need to bow or anything. He chuckled awkwardly when the woman rose with a confused expression on her face. Dear Kami she was cute. Too cute. Ak, Sasuke, upon noticing his friend's dilemma, decided to aid him instead of stabbing him like he usually would. Regardless of our previous actions with one another, his mismatched gaze traveling towards Susanoo, who did not back down from the stair. All is forgiven. It was a simple misunderstanding. The goddess furrowed her eyebrows in concern as she spoke, left hand coming to rest against her chest. Still, it is my duty as the leader of the Shinto pantheon to solve this issue. Whatever you want or need, I shall grant. Careful sister. The god of storms warned quietly. You trifle with humans. Hush. She snapped with angry eyes. It is your fault we are here in the first place. Susanoo's gray eyes alit with fire as he stood from the rubble he was seated upon. Mine. You were the one that destroyed Lady Yusaka's office. You convinced Tsukuyomi and I that the humans were back. The goddess shrunk at her younger brother's words, floundering for a rebuttal. She was saved by her former lover and brother. Susanoo. Tsukuyomi spoke, softly and quietly. Sister is not the only one to blame. We all made a mistake today. We should own up to it and hope for a better future. Susanoo stared at his older brother with a frustrated gaze. But, brother. No buts. Tsukuyomi spoke with a clipped tone. Accept what has happened and move on. We are leaders. We should act like them too. The younger god was silent for several moments before turning his head with a small huff. He said not a word and sat back down on the large piece of rubble, head tilted down and straw hat hiding his face. There was a few seconds of tense silence that wafted in the room before Naruto spoke with an unsure expression. Uh. Well, we don't really need much other than information. He snapped his fingers as he replied. Ooh, and a home or compound. We'd all like somewhere to stay. Yusaka's silky smooth voice responded before any of the gods could. I would not mind allowing you four to stay at my compound. The woman's golden yellow tails flowed behind her as she smiled. I'm sure Amaterasu sama would not mind procuring the information you need. The Kayubi turned towards the goddess and pinned with the woman with a dry stare, showing her exactly how she felt about having been injured and the subsequent destruction of her entire office. The beautiful goddess had the decency to wince at the Kayubi's statement and nodded her head with an embarrassed smile. I do apologize, Lady Yusaka. Yusaka stared at the woman for several seconds before sighing and shaking her head. I can never stay mad at you, Amaterasu-sama. Just please. Next time, use your words, please, she pleaded with the goddess. The sun goddess's embarrassed expression shifted, a beautiful smile forming on her face as she did so, of course. Yay. We're all friends. Sasuke cheered in a faux happy tone. Can we go now? I'd like to not fight again today. Dick. Naruto commented unhelpfully. Bite me. Eat shit. The two teens glared at one another before Sasuke disappeared with his fist reared back. The boy's knuckles wrapped against Naruto's face with a harsh crack, sending the teen flying through the building's only remaining wall. The Uchiha immediately launched himself towards Naruto's direction without a care in the world. Hey! Sakura screamed as she took off right behind Sasuke, stop fucking fighting. She was gone nearly a second later. The remaining gods and Kayubi stared at the trio's disappearing forms with confusion evident in their eyes. Their attention shifted when they noticed the silver-haired man slowly walk towards his companion's direction. I'll catch up. Eventually, his eyes continued to remain on his book. Probably, he flipped a page. Maybe, another page. Possibly. A devasting shockwave racked Kyoto, causing the man to stop. EHH. I'm good. Kakashi about faced before disappearing through the ruined building in the opposite direction. There was silence for several seconds as the Shinto gods and Yusaka processed what had just happened. They are. Amaterasu trailed off quietly, trying to find the right words. Unique? Tsukuyomi supplied helpfully. Insane. Suzanoo stated firmly. Strange. Yusaka affirmed. So cool. Amaterasu shouted with proverbial stars in her eyes. Did you see how quick that guy was? Suzanoo and Tsukuyomi just sighed heavily at their sister's actions while Yusaka smiled in amusement. It was going to be incredibly interesting with those four around, Yusaka just knew it. The last few days had been an annoying blur, at least Sasuke thought so. After their fight with the Shinto gods, Team 7 had been granted their own compounds to stay in. The compounds were very extravagant. Yes, that was the word. For it couldn't be anything other than that. 
the compounds granted to Team 7 had been bigger than the Uchiha clan compound in Konoha and that was saying something since the Uchiha clan had been the biggest clan before the massacre. While Sasuke could begrudgingly admire the tactic that Yasaka was doing to get in their good graces, it was completely unnecessary. Kyoto was their home, and with it being their home, Team 7 would protect it. They'd already lost the elemental nations, what more was there for them to lose besides each other? While Sasuke would never openly admit to it, he truly worried for his team. Not so much Naruto per se because the idiot was already stupidly powerful. No 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 Sasuke worried for Kakashi and Sakura. He'd never say it obviously. His pride was far too large for that but nevertheless, he still felt the inclination to watch over them. They weren't weak, at least to the trash that roamed Kyoto, but they weren't nearly as powerful as himself or Naruto. And that made them targets. Apparently Japan, the country, island that they now resided on, was a hotspot for several huge factions and pantheons, one of those factions being the biblical one. Or as Sasuke preferred to call them, the hypocrites. Because that's all the biblical faction consisted of. Devils, angels, and fallen angels. Hypocrites to a degree that would make Madara and Obito green with envy. Whereas Madara and Obito wished for some measure of peace through the Mugen Tsukuyomi, Still hypocritical regardless, the angels preached of kindness and acceptance but could barely accept their own sins. For how could one criticize and belittle those who possessed differing beliefs and demonize those who chose not to align with your own views? The devils were even worse. They were nothing but filth and trash. Greedy souls who believed that power and status triumphed over all. The creatures believed that anything they wished for or wanted was their rightful privilege. It left a bitter taste in Sasuke's mouth when thinking of the devils, it reminded him too much of the boy he had been before the war. Believing he was owed everything just because he was more talented than others, felt that his grief and suffering was more than others. He hated the devils and he had yet to even meet one. Of course if speaking rationally, Sasuke knew that his distaste for the creatures stemmed from his own self-hatred but it wasn't something that was going to just go away. After all, not every shinobi was a good person and not every devil was a bad person. The same applied for the angels that called heaven their home and for the fallen angels that called the underworld their home alongside the devils. Sasuke himself would be a hypocrite if he didn't acknowledge the fact that not every yokai was a saint either. Being biased would get him nowhere and he had come to accept this from his time with Orochimaru. Some individuals did not deserve sympathy in this world regardless of race and belief. Men and women who would sacrifice others and sodomize their own people was a monster that needed to be put down. Men get treated as men and dogs get put down. An eye for an eye was an analogy that Sasuke wholeheartedly believed in. He, now at least, would give his life if it would erase all the sins he had committed in the elemental nations. But life stopped for no one and it wouldn't any time soon. Sasuke-sama. The ebony-haired avenger would have rolled his eyes had they not been closed. Why did the servants address him with that honorific? He had done nothing to deserve it. Slowly rising from his kneeled position on the floor, Sasuke turned towards the entrance of his room, spotting a random servant under Yusaka's command. The servant was silent for but a moment before speaking, avoiding eye contact. L Lady Yusaka calls for you. I was sent to inform and retrieve you. The woman exhaled quietly, glad that she had only stuttered once this time rather than the eight times when she had first met him. Sasuke stared at the woman for a moment before glancing towards the picture that sat on the table in front of him. Did Yusaka inform you on why exactly she wished to see me? His mismatched orbs trailed along the old and worn picture, noticing its crinkled and slightly torn edges. The old photo was framed in a slightly sloppy manner and was several times smaller than the frame it was in. The woman cleared her throat quietly before replying quietly. She did not, Sasuke-sama. Her vibrant orbs fell to her feet as silence met her statement. The Avenger let the silence carry on for several long seconds before slowly turning his head towards the woman. Wait outside. Having said his piece, Sasuke turned his head away from the woman. Not a moment later did the woman offer a nod, which went unseen, before closing the door to the room. The ebony-haired teen fixated his attention back on the framed photo and withheld a quiet sigh. He slowly approached the photo before picking it up and placing it back on the table, hiding the old image of his mother. It was the only photo he possessed of his clan. There were plenty more but he had chosen to leave them behind in the Uchiha compound. The only happy memories he would associate with the clan after Itachi's horrendous actions was that of his mother. His father had been cut out of the picture alongside that of Itachi and himself, leaving only the image of his smiling mother on it. Sasuke sighed quietly before grabbing his kusanagi and sheath and leaving the room. The smell of cement and concrete filled Kakashi's nostrils as he took in a deep breath. His heartbeat slowed to a degree that would have worried even a doctor as his vision sharpened. 
The silver-haired Jonan adjusted his prone body, legs spreading along the dirty and chalky wood as he shifted the weapon that sat in his hands. A gloved hand slowly reached up to adjust the magnification of the scope he was looking through. His right hand curled around the grip of the sniper rifle, index finger lightly resting on the trigger of the weapon. Kakashi gazed through the scope for several minutes as he remained as still as a statue. Barely two weeks into the yokai faction and he was already being hired to kill people. Money talks and evil never rests. Kakashi would have snorted in amusement if he wasn't waiting for his target to grace his crosshair. A hitman was the term used. Kakashi still preferred shinobi, though. Hitman just sounded odd. Being a contract killer hadn't been his first choice but Kakashi was a killer. A damn good one at that. He might not be the absolute powerhouses that Sasuke and Naruto were but he was an efficient killer. He had enough bodies under his name that would earn the respect of even the most profound shinobi in elemental nations. Anyone could kill after all. The skill lied with the how, when, and where. Give him a target and no matter the difficulty, he'd eliminate them. An assassin was a better term for Kakashi but at his core he was still a shinobi. He had flair and assassins lacked it. Shinobi were prideful and as always, loved to show off. Counterproductive when it came to their professions but semantics were something Kakashi cared little for. Kakashi's thoughts stopped upon noticing an all-black sedan slowly pull up to the coffee shop he was scouting. His crosshair glided over the back right window as his breathing slowed. His target? A billionaire. His crime? Not Kakashi's business in all honesty. His name? Yuio Suzume. He was sort of a big deal in Japan. A man worth billions who owned several large companies and was responsible for most of the modern infrastructure that resided in Tokyo. Why was he being targeted then? That was sort of sticky. Yuio wasn't necessarily evil but he wasn't a saint either. Any individual able to collect a wealth as large as his was never clean. It just wasn't feasible to garner copious amounts of money without stepping on toes and rubbing shoulders with criminal activists. Yuio was an ordinary man to that degree. Buying hedge funds and holding smaller businesses hostage as their companies slowly rotted from the outside due to shortage of stock trades, exploiting workers for minimum pay and skirting legalities. They were relatively tame for a billionaire. Unless of course you added the illegal prostitution ring and drug cartel he monitored. Yuio was a shitty individual responsible for unshitty advances in Japan. But why specifically had he been drawn into affairs that involved the yokai? It's a funny story that one. Yuio didn't actually know that yokai even existed. Hilarious right? Kakashi thought so at least. Yuio was just a man that had been at the wrong place at the wrong time. And by wrong place, Kakashi meant that he had basically groomed two young yokai women into being prostitutes. And by wrong time, Kakashi meant that those two young yokai women had been raped and killed shortly after being bought. So, it was really just unfortunate luck on Yuiho's part. A pair of wolf yokai had suddenly disappeared when on a trip to Tokyo a few years back. Apparently they were the daughters of a rather influential yokai who sat in Yusaka's inner council. When the man had learned of his daughter's fate, it had became a moot point. Yuiho's death was inevitable and no amount of money would change that. Was it fair to bully humans? Of course it was. Was it fair to Yuio? Of course not. Did Kakashi truly care? No a job was a job and a contract was just a contract. Yuio fucked up and now he was paying the price, even if he didn't know he had fucked up. Maybe next time he won't fuck up. The door of the black sedan was opened by a man in a black suit, obviously one of Yuiho's bodyguards. The man of the hour slowly stepped out of the vehicle before being crowded by his bodyguards while slowly entering into the cafe. Kakashi's scope followed the man the entire time never leaving the man's form. He could have shot him long ago, could have ended the man as soon as the door was opened. But Kakashi was a perfectionist at everything he did. Learning jutsus, hobbies, etc. everything needed to be perfect. And so Kakashi would wait for the perfect shot. His lower body adjusted one final time as he witnessed Yuio ordering his routine coffee and bagel. The man loved his coffee black with no cream and bagel with cheese. He always sat in the back corner of the restaurant, visible from only one side of the establishment. Yuio was a man of routine. He did the same thing every morning, right to the exact minute. In a few moments the man would take a sip of his coffee and bite into his bagel before dabbing his face with the napkin in his right hand. It was always the right hand. Never left. Left was communism. Bad. Not a second later did Yuio do those exact things, down to the napkin being in the right hand. Kakashi's breathing slowed and he inhaled a hefty amount of oxygen before going completely motionless, his crosshair centered just above the man's nose and he waited patiently as the wind began to subside. Guns were messy, too loud and flashy, even for Kakashi's standards. 
but they got the job done just fine. A bullet would do nothing against a majority of the factions that existed in the supernatural world but for humans. It was practically inescapable. Kakashi's index finger curled around the trigger of his weapon and not a moment later did the bullet eject from the large caliber rifle in his hands. An incredibly loud noise barked from the weapon, a minor shockwave of air blasting the surrounding dust and dirt beneath the weapon. It was an odd thing. Watching a bullet travel through the air as if in slow motion. At least Kakashi thought so. He could actually outrun the damn thing and place his kunai right between the man's brain faster than the bullet from the sniper. But of course, he had to make it look like an assassination. Wouldn't do the yokai good if humans somehow caught wind of supernatural beings. No good at all. Microseconds later Yuiho's head practically exploded, painting the wall behind him in brain matter and blood. Panic cries and movement began to spread throughout the establishment. Kakashi relinquished his grip on the weapon and disappeared from his sniper nest, leaving no evidence of his existence. Kakashi reappeared in the safe house designated by Lady Yusaka a few moments later. With his job done, he had nothing to do. The man pulled out his hentai manga and was moments away from sitting down in the old and dusty safe house before pausing for the briefest moments. Kakashi-sama. The janin resisted the urge to sigh and paused midway in his movements to sit down. His charcoal eyes slowly trailed to the yokai that rested in the corner of the room, her stealth skills were actually incredibly commendable, and silently raised an eyebrow. The woman slowly stepped out of the shadows after being silently addressed before speaking. Apologies Kakashi-sama, but Lady Yusaka has asked that you immediately return to Kyoto upon completion of your assassination. She bowed a moment later, revealing the scaled tail that rested near her lower back. Kakashi sighed quietly before slowly putting his book back into his jacket pocket and replying, Is there a reason? I was under the assumption that I'd get to rest before returning. He didn't have anything against Yusaka or anything but he was just curious. The woman herself had sanctioned his mission and debriefed him on who the man was. Perhaps she needed him for another contract. The reptilian yokai bowed her head briefly before responding in a respectful tone. Lady Yusaka has another mission for you. I was graced with the briefest amounts of information regarding the task and was only told that you would be accompanying Sasuke-sama. Brow raised and interest peaked, Kakashi responded. All the more interesting then. He lazily held his hand towards the woman before speaking once more. Shall we, Malachite? The young woman smiled in amusement before grasping the man's hand. Thank you, Kakashi-sama. They disappeared not a second later, leaving the safe house abandoned. Sasuke strapped his blade and sheathed behind him before staring at himself in the mirror. Gone was the old uniform and open-collared vest he previously wore. In its place was an unbuttoned black shirt with a pocket on his left breast. He wore a black shirt underneath that with grey form-fitting pants and black boots. Around his neck was a gold chain with the crest of the Uchiha clan as a medallion. Stating at his reflection, Sasuke couldn't help but frown. He felt weird in these more modern clothes. His open-toed sandals were the hardest thing to really get used to since he had never worn actual shoes outside of slippers when he was a kid. He didn't necessarily hate how he looked but it would just take time. At least he hoped so. The rest of Team 7 had taken their change of fashion rather easily with the only complaints coming from Naruto who wanted to wear his mesh armor underneath his clothing. Other than that, everyone handled it fine. Perhaps he was the one just making a big deal out of nothing. Stating at his reflection in the mirror one last time, Sasuke sighed before reaching up to the collars of his shirt and popping them up, reminiscent to all the other high-collared shirts he wore in the elemental nations. Always pop the collar. Sasuke left his room after that, giving a single nod to the servant awaiting outside. Without another word spoken, the pair traveled through the hallways of the compound to Yusaka's office. Several minutes passed by in silence before the pair rounded a corner that had Sasuke coning to an abrupt stop, almost causing the servant to collide with his back. Not a moment later did Sakura around the corner at a rather brisk pace carrying what seemed to be at least 15 manila folders and documents. Sakura came to a stop upon noticing Sasuke and gave the teen a smile with a small wave, adjusting the folders in her off hand. Sasuke. What are you doing? She asked, emerald eyes burning curiously, no doubt noticing the servant with him. Sasuke did not answer immediately as his eyes roamed down her body, noticing her wardrobe. Sakura's hair flowed down past her neck no longer being held up by her Konoha headband. She wore a long-sleeved, light pink sweater that was cut off just a few inches past her breasts that showed off her toned stomach. A pair of jet black yoga pants hugged her legs nicely with a pair of white sneakers upon her feet. Her outfit suited her, she looked good, he meant that honestly. Dragging his gaze back to the woman, he offered a small shrug. Yusako wants to see me, I don't know what for. 
Sakura shifted her weight on her right leg, hip cocking outwards accentuating her curves. Ah. Well, whatever it is, good luck. She offered him a small smile before smiling at the servant accompanying Sasuke. Hello to you as well, Suzu. The yokai offered the pink-haired teen a smile while bowing. Greetings to you as well, Sakura-sama. Now now now. Sakura chided playfully. None of that. Suzu did not respond and only offered the woman another smile and bow. Sakura, in return, just huffed quietly with a playful roll of the eyes. Anywho, good luck on whatever it is you're doing Sasuke. She adjusted the folders in her hands before continuing. Medical personnel files and whatnot. Kami I'm going to go crazy. See you around Sasuke. She bounded off immediately afterwards with a small sway of the hips, humming quietly as she did so. Sasuke's eyes trailed after her the entire time, watching until she rounded the corner. He stared at the spot for several seconds before sighing quietly and turning around and moving towards Yusaka's office. Upon rounding the last hallway, he noticed that Kakashi was standing just a few feet from the door as well. The man was reading his manga with a disinterested expression on his face. The Janin's old Konoha uniform was replaced by a black long-sleeved button-up dress shirt. He wore a pair of black dress shoes coupled with black slacks and suspenders that binded the weapons he used on his contracts and missions. He no longer wore his old neck and face covering and instead had opted to use a black surgical mask. Naruto had said that Kakashi looked spiffy in his outfit. Sasuke would agree to some extent. The man was dressed sharply that was for sure. The Avenger slowly made his way to Kakashi before stopping just out of the man's reach. No words were said for a few moments as both men chose to remain silent. Both servants bowed before slowly blinding down the hall and disappearing around the corner that Sasuke previously emerged from. Slapping his manga closed, Kakashi offered an eye smile to his former student, shall we? The Uchiha did not verbally respond but offered a brief nod of the head. A moment later did the teen open the door to Yusaka's office. Sasuke and Kakashi were greeted with relative silence as they both entered the room, all talking coming to a hold as the door closed behind them. The duo were actually surprised that the room was filled with Yusaka's inner council. They usually weren't summoned unless Yusaka herself had something incredibly important to say or do. Sasuke shifted quietly with Kakashi slouching for the briefest of moments. It was not meant to be a gesture of disrespect but Yusaka's council did not truly know them. And to them, it was seen as anything but disrespectful. Yusaka however, didn't seem to mind or care. Kakashi. Sasuke. Yusaka greeted with a small smile. Her amber orbs shifted between the two men for but a moment before settling in Kakashi. I take it that the mission was successful? Kakashi smiled beneath his surgical mask before answering. Yuio is on his way to the morgue as we speak, Yusaka-sama. The blonde Kayubi perked up at this with a small nod. Good, she clapped her hands for a moment before clasping them together and placing her elbows on the table in front of her. Now, I'm sure you two are curious as to why you're here. She ventured with a raised eyebrow. The two shinobi traded eyes with one another for a moment before Sasuke crossed his arms against his chest. Is there someone you want dead that you don't believe Kakashi can handle? He asked with a raised eyebrow, highly doubting that to be the case. Kakashi was a contract killer for small fry supernatural beings and the occasional human that drew a little too close to yokai. It was nothing to say of the man's skill and power but Sasuke highly doubted there were targets out there that Kakashi couldn't handle. Gods and leaders of other factions notwithstanding of course. Yusaka's smile was filled with mirth as she responded. If I needed you for a contract then we would be starting a war, Sasuke-kun. He'd give her that one, to be fair. Shaking her head, Yusaka continued. No 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 this is a rather, delicate matter. One that the yokai faction should have done more for had we possessed the resources we do now. There was a brief moment of silence that settled in the room as Kakashi and Sasuke traded a brief glance. Would this by any chance be about the rogue devil yokai? Kakashi ventured with a raised brow, left hand resting in his pocket. Yusaka smirked with a nod of the head. Your abilities to decipher my words in an instant is quite terrifying. Sasuke shrugged indifferently as he responded lazily. We'd be dead otherwise. Ma Sasuke. No need to be melodramatic. Kakashi responded in a patronizing tone. Shut up, you lanky fuck. The Uchiha responded placidly. The masked Janin only offered a small smile at Sasuke's words. The disrespect from you two is still astounding. A yokai member offhandedly commented. Sasuke and Kakashi glanced at the rather large man before dismissing him with little more than a single glance. Which of course, annoyed the man but the shinobi cared little. It is quite alright, Lao. Sasuke and Kakashi are just. Unique. Yusaka commented in an amused tone, 
smiling inwardly at the annoyed eye roll from the Uchiha. But you are correct, Kakashi. This delicate matter revolves around the devil yokai, Kuroka. She was labeled an SSS class threat that was to be killed on sight or avoided at all costs. Sasuke was silent for a moment before gesturing with his right hand. You want us to hunt her down? Yasaka immediately heard the shift of his tone. It became decidedly sharp. She had no doubt in her mind that the teen had researched heavily into Kuroka's case. The yokai leader shook her head. No, I wouldn't dream of it. Kuroka is a powerful yokai in her own right and hunting one of our own for the crimes of that devil is beneath us. Hmm. Then what is it? Kakashi asked curiously. Yusaka covered her mouth with her clenched hands before speaking quietly. When Kuroka was branded a rogue devil, the Nekosho race was hunted to near extinction. Due to complicated consequences, we could not intervene. A war with the devils would have ended the yokai. Sasuke stated in brutal fashion, his arms crossing once more. Yusaka closed her eyes before sighing quietly and responding. The yokai lose an entire race of beings and I was forced to grind my teeth and watch those who had committed those heinous acts get a slap on the wrist. She shook her head ruefully before glancing towards the ceiling. Lady Amaterasu wished to war with the devils on the spot. I talked her out of it. The Shinto faction lacked the firepower that the devils possessed. We were forced to bow our heads and grit our teeth at the loss. The Kayubi went silent for a few moments before raising her head and staring at the two shinobi in front of her. Her amber eyes hardened exponentially so as she spoke. We no longer need to fear retaliation. I want reparations. I demand those who committed those crimes to be punished. I will not allow my people to be trampled upon any longer. Sasuke stated at the women for a few seconds before a small smirk crossed his face. Japan is Shinto territory. Rumor has it that the devils have two heiresses, who happen to be of direct lineage to two of the four satans, residing in Kuo. Yusaka couldn't hide the smirk that graced her face. These two were far too perceptive. A few words and they could read her intentions like an open book. Kakashi raised an eyebrow before speaking, potentially risking war. Sasuke scoffed quietly. If we wanted them dead, they'd already be dead. The masked Jonan nodded his head before stroking his chin. There is that. I reckon you want us to pressure the heiresses, yes. Kakashi ventured quietly. When no one corrected him, he continued. As long as those two heiresses reside in Kuo then they are bargaining chips. The Uchiha scoffed in disdain. The devils are arrogant to think they'd never be capitalized on. There was several murmurs that broke out amongst the yokai members in the room. Statements that supported the actions and others that believed it was too aggressive. The talking went on for several minutes as the yokai members bickered with another. It was then eventually silenced as Yusaka rose her hand, gesturing for everyone to stop talking. The Shinto faction has remained passive for long enough. I have Lady Amaterasu's blessing. There was a tense silence in the room for several long seconds before it was broken by Sasuke. What exactly do you want us to do in Kuo? Yusaka's smile was positively devious. Yusaka hummed quietly to herself as she lazily spun in her reclining chair. Sasuke and Kakashi had left a few hours ago, heading directly to Kuo. She had already sent a messenger to Kuo several hours earlier to the heiresses stating that two representatives of the yokai faction would be speaking with them. She received no word back from the heiresses but it mattered little. Sasuke and Kakashi had their mission and she highly doubted that they'd come back empty-handed. Her council had left only a few minutes ago and their distrust and dislike of the otherworldly shinobi, while understandable, was annoying. These four chakra-wielding humans were a boon. There were a few in her inner circle who actually didn't mind the presence of Team 7 and the shift in power they presented but they were clearly outnumbered. But at the end of the day she was the leader of the yokai and she vouched for them. It also helped that a majority of the Shinto kami had vouched for Team 7 as well. Praise Amaterasu. Yusaka's thoughts were interrupted as a series of knocks resounded from the doors of her office. She placed her elbow on the table before propping her head on her clenched fist. Come in. The doors slowly opened afterwards and revealed it to be Naruto. The blonde-haired Jinchuriki grinned and rose his hand while greeting boisterously. Yusaka-chan. The woman's smile softened as her amber eyes roamed along Naruto's form. The entirety of Team 7 had their wardrobes overhauled and she had to admit, they all looked rather nice. And Naruto was no exception to this either. Gone was the old zipped-up jumpsuit, tracksuit outfit he arrived in. The teen now wore an orange and black pullover hoodie with two specific designs on it. On the back of the hoodie was his clan's symbol, an outward spiral, and on the front of the hoodie resting over where his heart would be, was the number 9. He wore a pair of light gray, form-fitting sweatpants and wore a pair of orange and black sneakers. Yusaka's eyes slowly rose to meet Naruto's and she took note of the boy's rather bashful expression. She found it both amusing and endearing. 
Do you wanted to see me Yusaka-chan? Naruto asked with a smile. The Kayubi yokai nodded her head before gesturing to the seat right next to her. Yes, please sit. The blonde teen made his way across the room and took a seat next to the beautiful woman. He spun his chair towards her and offered her a large smile while his right hand idly tapped on the wooden table. Yusaka briefly glanced at the teen's hand before smiling. I sent Sasuke and Kakashi to Kuo. She watched the boy's eyebrows furrow in confusion for a moment before realization dawned on his face. Ah. So that's why I sensed them leaving Kyoto. I was confused for a bit. His knee began to idly bounce as his eyes found hers. Su. What are they doing in Kuo? Yusaka's left hand gently rested atop the boy's right hand as she spoke. Do you remember the story I told you about Kuroka? She immediately noticed how the boy's features hardened. Well, I sent Sasuke and Kakashi to send a message of sorts. Naruto was silent for several seconds, his eyebrows furrowing as he thought of why Yusaka would send someone like Sasuke to. Oh. Oh. Oh no. You sent Sasuke? He questioned with widened eyes. He's liable to kill someone. A giggle escaped Yusaka as she stroked the boy's hand. It will be fine Naruto-kun. All Sasuke and Kakashi are doing is speaking with the devil heiresses that reside in Kuo. Those two girls are operating in our territory after all. They must remember to tread lightly. Naruto grimaced lightly before acquiescing to the woman's statement. Yeah. But like, it's Sasuke we're talking about. He's an asshole. Yusaka held back the snort of laughter that wished to escape. The Uchiha was a bit on the harsher side but he had never been outright rude directly to her. The teen was certainly cold and held little respect and care for others but he was never cross with her. Be that as it may. She spoke slowly with an amused smile. They are likely already in Kuo as we speak. I thought about sending Sakura in Sasuke's place but decided that if a show of strength was necessary that Sasuke would prove fairer. I of course mean no disrespect to Sakura herself. Naruto just smiled at the woman's statement before replying. Sakura-chan is strong and she knows it. I'm sure if she was here that she'd agree with you. Yusaka's fingers lightly tapped on Naruto's hand as she smiled. I'm sure she would. Now, how are you Naruto-kun? Are you adjusting well? The blonde cerulean orbs glanced down to his hand for the briefest of moments before shooting back towards the woman's amber orbs. I'm doing well. Well, I still get kinda homesick and I definitely miss my home. He trailed off quietly before perking up again. But I love it here. I'm glad you are enjoying your time Naruto-kun. Yusaka responded with a gentle smile. The next few hours were spent just talking as both blondes relaxed and relished in one another's company. Little did they know that a particular event would transpire in Kuo revolving around Kakashi and Sasuke that would eventually force Team 7 into the spotlight of the other factions. Kakashi and Sasuke arrived in the relatively small city of Kuo and it was far smaller than Kyoto. The two men glanced at one another before making their way deeper into the city, focusing on the unique signatures that populated Kuo Academy. The pair hardly spoke to one another, Kakashi opting to read his hentai and Sasuke preferring the relative silence. Half an hour passed by before the pair reached the high school that housed a plethora of unique and different signatures. Sasuke's eyebrow rose minutely at the different signatures he sensed. He could sense four unique and different signatures in the high school which caused him to pause for the briefest moments. Ah. That must be the work of the evil pieces. Kakashi commented quietly, ignoring the looks he was receiving from the wandering pedestrians outside of the school's gates. It doesn't completely hide their original signature. Sasuke replied while stuffing his hands into his pockets. There's four unique signatures in the school. I can sense humans in a pair of yokai. I also sense several darker signatures which I assume are the devils as well as a pure signature that appears to be tainted. Likely a fallen angel. The two men stood at the gated entrance for a few moments before seeing four female students slowly making their way towards the gates. Three of the women carried the darker signature leading both shinobi to assume that they were devils. The other woman carried the tainted light signature as well as the darker signature that her cohorts possessed. She was likely a fallen angel. The four women eventually reached the gates and Sasuke resisted the urge to raise an eyebrow. How much milk did those two women drink? Their chests rivaled Tsunade's. Glancing towards Kakashi. Sasuke proceeded to roll his eyes. His former sensei was sending a small smirk his way while wagging his eyebrows. How did Sasuke know that Kakashi was smirking? He just did. The first woman was a red head whose hair trailed all the way down past her rear. Her eyes were a very vibrant blue and her chest was large. Standing next to the redhead was a beauty in her own right. Her long ebony ponytail trailed all the way down her back and nearly kissed the ground. Her eyes were a beautiful violet and her chest was larger than the redhead's which was already impressive in itself. 
Standing next to her was another woman with ebony hair whose locks reached down to her knees. She wore a pair of glasses and possessed heterochromatic eyes. She was quite beautiful. And last but not least, was yet another woman who possessed ebony hair, though hers was the shortest among the group. She also wore a pair of glasses and possessed vibrant violet orbs similar to his Rinnegan. She certainly lacked in the chest department compared to the other girls in the group. After assessing the young women, Sasuke glanced towards Kakashi before noticing the man's annoying expression. The Uchiha lashed out with his elbow, hitting Kakashi in his ribs and causing the man to release a rather painful wheeze. Ma Sasuke-kun, so rude, Kakashi commented lightly. You're old enough to be their father, Sasuke replied placidly. Before Kakashi could reply, one of the women, the fallen angel hybrid, spoke aloud. Era era, I wouldn't mind calling him daddy. Why don't you take that mask off for me? The girl proceeded to wink afterwards, her attention directed only on Kakashi. A small smile graced Kakashi's face, which was hidden by his surgical mask, as he responded, I don't think that'd be legal M's. He trailed off, fishing for the girl's name. Akano Himejima. She responded as her eyes squinted, but don't worry, I won't tell anyone. Akano. The redhead sputtered with a minor blush on her face, stop that. The two women who possessed glasses didn't seem to be affected by Akino's words and possessed calculative expressions on their faces, giving little away. I assume that you two are the yokai representatives that Lady Yasaka spoke of? Sasuke's dual-colored orbs traveled to the shorter glasses wearing teen while nodding his head. The teen adjusted her glasses before offering a small bow. My name is Sona Sitri, heiress to the Sitri clan. She gestured with her hand towards the other woman with glasses before speaking. This is my queen, Tsubaki Shinra. The dual-colored woman offered the men a bow before addressing them. It is nice to make your acquaintance, please call me Shinra. Sasuke granted the woman a brief nod while Kakashi raised two fingers in a lazy salute. Hello. I'm Rias Gremory, heiress to the Gremory clan. The red-headed beauty responded with a small smile. She gestured to Akano before continuing. Akano is my queen. The ebony-haired teen licked her lips before offering the two shinobi a low bow. Please, call me whatever you like though I prefer to be called master. Akano noticed, with some measure of disappointment, that the two men barely batted an eye at her sultry response. She'd clearly have to try harder then. I'm Sasuke Uchiha. Gesturing to his left, he continued. Kakashi Hataki. The lanky man offered the teens a lazy salute coupled with an eye smile. We are here to speak on behalf of Yusaka regarding certain issues in Japan. Sasuke finished with a blank stare. Sona and her queen's eyes seemed to sharpen at the statement while Rias seemed to be slightly confused. Sasuke mentally shook his head at the girl's confusion. Little girl. She clearly wasn't suited to lead. Are you able to speak now or will we be forced to wait? Sasuke none too subtly commented, eyes staring ahead at the school for a moment before returning to Sona, who he had already deemed as the more intelligent individual of the group. The shorter girl adjusted her glasses for a moment before glancing towards Rias who seemed to be slightly offended at Sasuke's rather direct and brunt demeanor. If it is alright with both of you then I can have Tsubaki allow you to rest in the school council office while we finish up our classes. That is, if you are willing to wait. Sona responded with one arm beneath her breasts while her other hand gently gripped her glasses. Sona watched as the two men shared a brief glance, seemingly speaking without verbally doing so. The two were quiet for a moment before the taller man offered his partner an eye smile. They seemed to come to a decision almost immediately afterwards as the younger male directed his gaze back to her. That is suitable, he responded with a simple nod. Sona nodded her head before gesturing for Tsubaki to open the gates. Not a second later did the gates begin to open, the two men slowly stepping foot onto the academy grounds. Tsubaki. Please direct Sasuke-san and Kakashi-san to the student council office. Tsubaki bowed to her king before turning towards Sasuke and Kakashi and gesturing for the men to follow her. The two shinobi followed without hesitation, slowly disappearing into the school behind Tsubaki. They're strong, Sona commented with furrowed eyebrows. You sensed it too? Rias questioned while glancing towards her friend. The Sitri heiress adjusted her glasses as she responded. They reminded me of Syroorg, they're dangerous. Era. More reason to watch them, no? Akano stated in an amused fashion. Hum. The redhead hummed quietly as she played with a strand of her long hair. Interesting. The Citri heiress could easily see the greed that shone brightly in Rias' eyes. She wanted them in her peerage. It was highly unlikely that they'd reincarnate. But what was odd was the feeling she got from them. They were. Human. Not yokai. It was strange because she could sense the bountiful amount of chakra that coursed through their veins. 
while they were clearly suppressing most of it she could tell that they possessed an egregious amount of it. Humans with chakra. Interesting indeed. A pair of golden orbs shone with curiosity as Sasuke and Kakashi disappeared into Kuo Academy. Humans with chakra. How interesting, NYA, those two men were powerful. Even more so than she. Their chakra eclipsed even hers and she was absolutely certain that it eclipsed Yasaka's as well. How had Yusaka found them? Now that she thought about it, Ophis had spoken with her briefly about being in contact with four incredibly powerful humans who could wield chakra. Ophis had never given a direct answer as to where they were or what they looked like or even their names, but she had confirmed that they were in Japan. A large smile formed on Kuroka's face as she stared at the school. Things were getting interesting. Valley did say he was itching to fight some strong people. Maybe she could convince him to come to Kuo. Sasuke and Kakashi entered the office, noticing the handful of students in the room with them. All of them were devils and were likely a part of Sona's peerage. Tsubaki guided the shinobi towards the large round table in the center of the room before gesturing for them to sit. Please, make yourselves comfortable. School does get out for another hour or so. If you need anything, please let Momo know. She gestured towards the white-haired teen who responded with a nod of the head. Thank you for your hospitality. Kakashi responded with an eye smile. Tsubaki said nothing in response but offered the men a low bow before leaving the office. Glancing around the room, Sasuke eyed each of the members of Sona's peerage and outside of the male who was glaring at him, they seemed normal enough. The Uchiha turned his attention on his former sensei before resting his head atop his fist. We were being watched outside. Kakashi glanced towards his former student before leaning back in his chair, not caring about the fact that Sona's peerage was listening in on their conversation. Ahem. Kakashi hummed quietly, fishing his hentai manga out of his pockets. I sensed her the moment we arrived in Kuo, she's quite strong. The Uchiha closed his eyes before replying, You believe it's Kuroka? The shinobi ignored the quiet gasps that were released from Sona's peerage. Hum. Hard to say honestly, but she felt like a normal yokai on top of the devil signature she gave off. I believe it's Kuroka. Sasuke was silent for a moment before replying, Should we approach her? Kakashi turned a page in his manga, briefly reading over the dialogue and erotic scenes before replying. We might spook her. Who knows? We should wait and see if she'll come to us. She's definitely curious. The shinobi stopped talking with one another and went silent, not caring of the fact that one of Sona's peerage members rushed out of the room, most likely informing the woman of what they heard. Brash decision but it wasn't their business. This was all conjecture on their part. The next hour passed by in relative silence between the shinobi and Sona's remaining peerage members, up until a rather loud bell rang throughout the entirety of the school, signaling that the students were allowed to leave and go home. It took another half hour or so for the entirety of the school and its students to file out and head home for the day. When the door to the office opened, neither shinobi batted an eye and continued to do what they had been doing since coming into the room. Sasuke was silent with his eyes closed and Kakashi was still reading his hentai manga, it was the sight that Rias and her peerage came upon while entering the student council office. Kakashi-san, Sasuke-san. Rias greeted with a brief nod of the head, which was eventually reciprocated by both males. The rest of Rias' peerage slowly settled into the room and the only one who seemed truly affected by the shinobi's presence was Rias' rook. Judging by her widened eyes and fearful expression, it was anything but good. Flipping a page through his erotic manga, Kakashi briefly glanced at the reincarnated yokai. A yokai. He feigned ignorance while raising a single brow. How interesting. What race? The petite girl seemed to get even smaller at the man's question and her amber orbs shot toward Sasuke with frightening speed. All of Rias' peerage noticed the girl's reaction to the men but couldn't ascertain the reasoning. Did Kaneko know these two men? If so, how? Ma, Sasuke. The masked man chided with a small smirk. Your chakra is scaring her. Sasuke, whose eyes had remained closed up until this point finally opened them while glancing towards the young yokai. His mismatched orbs stared directly at the girl, who seemed desperate to make herself as tiny and unassuming as possible. After a few more moments of staring, he turned away and settled his gaze upon Kakashi. She's probably scared of your shitty manga. Kakashi actually released a few genuine laughs at the teen's statement. Shitty is certainly a word but the kami smiled down on me as I read. Can you say the same? The Uchiha scoffed quietly before relaxing in his seat. She fears my chakra. It's dark, he explained simply. Ahem. That it is Sasuke, that it is, Kakashi affirmed. Kaneko? Rias questioned with concern in her eyes. Are you okay? You don't have to be here if you don't want. The little rook glanced towards her king before returning her gaze to the shinobi. 
She was quiet for a few moments before swallowing heavily and speaking. I'd like to leave, Rias. The redhead's gaze softened before she nodded her head. We will speak later, okay? Kaneko nodded her head before shooting out of her seat and leaving the room as quickly as possible, not wanting to be anywhere near the two shinobi. You drive away every woman Sasuke. How will you ever hope to repopulate the Uchiha clan if you continue to do so? Kakashi commented with an amused smirk. Sasuke's blank eyes slowly settled on Kakashi as he spoke in a dead tone. I can send you back to Kyoto, in pieces. The silver-haired Jonin turned a page in his manga before shaking his head. I prefer being whole. Then shut up. Sasuke retorted blankly. There was a silence that followed for several minutes before Akano slowly entered the room followed by Sona and the remaining members of her peerage. Sona slowly glided across the room before settling in the seat next to Rias who was sitting opposite to Sasuke and Kakashi. Both of the women's queens took their place behind their kings and stood quietly. Sona clasped her hands together before placing her elbows on the table. I apologize for keeping you waiting but there was a matter that I needed to look into. She bowed her after her statement to which Sasuke and Kakashi promptly waved off. Kakashi smiled before slapping his manga shut and placing it into one of his pockets and speaking, it is quite all right. The Citri heiress gestured with her head towards Tsubaki as she spoke, is there anything you two would like? Refreshments? Snacks? Before Kakashi could answer, Sasuke did for him, no. Kakashi glanced at the teen for a brief moment before shrugging his shoulders, he wouldn't have minded some tea but it was fine. Sona dipped her head in acknowledgement before replying. As you wish, she trailed off the briefest of moments before continuing. Should we talk about Lady Yusaka's request? Rias leaned forward towards the table, breasts practically spilling onto the table as she spoke curiously. Why exactly are you two here? There was no disrespect or acid in her tone, only curiosity, which was understandable. It had been several years since the incident with Kuroka killing her former master after all. Deciding to be as blunt and forward as possible. Sasuke crossed his arms against his chest before leaning back in his seat. The Shinto pantheon demands reparations for the actions committed by your kind in regards to the massacre of the Nekosho race. Failure to do so will result in immediate retaliation by order of the Omikami herself, Amaterasu. The silence that settled in the room after Sasuke's statement was a heavy one. A silence that was both slightly horrifying and ludicrous. Sona's expression tapered off from its normal stoic and stern demeanor and resembled that of a shocked and slightly confused child. Rias was no better and looked even worse than her fellow heiress. Kakashi glanced at his companion, taking note of the boy's blank expression. Nothing is ever easy with you, is it? He asked rhetorically. Shut up, Kakashi. Their words seemed to restart the heiress's brains as they got over their initial shock and surprise at the teen's response. Sona adjusted her glasses with furrowed brows before speaking in a slightly perplexed tone. Forgive me but, what? Sasuke's mismatched orb centered on the Citri heiress before he spoke. The Shinto pantheon demand that those who hunted the Nekosho race to near extinction, are punished for their crimes. The boy's Rinnegan began to glow as his Sharingan activated, the matured version slowly spinning before shifting into its Mangeku variation. The yokai faction craves the deaths of those who defiled and slaughtered the two will be passing the message along to your leaders. Failure to do so. Sasuke's chakra did not leak out of his body. It practically erupted out of his body. The entire city of Kuo and even beyond seemed to feel the full brunt of his chakra. The earth shook and the sky roared as the teen's chakra manifested around his body, surrounding him in a sickening miasma of purple energy. And the full brunt of the Shinto pantheon will rain true hell down upon your people. And just as quickly as it came, it went. The earth stopped shaking, the skies calmed down, and everything seemed to become normal. Though, there was nothing normal about the power that was just released from the teen sitting just a few feet away from the heiresses. Fear. Terror. Despair. That's what filled Sona's entire being as she stared at the young teen in front of her. This. That power. It. Wasn't right. Primal fear coursed through her very veins as she tried to desperately slow her rapidly beating heart. This man. He wasn't human. He couldn't be. Her mind refused to think of him as anything other than a monster and no person possessed power like that. Images of her rotting carcass flashed through her mind as she continued to stare at the teen. No 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 no. Monster. Fiend. Abomination. Before Sona's thoughts could spiral even further towards insanity, a familiar and very powerful presence appeared in the room. Sona's violet orbs snapped towards the source of said presence and relief began to immediately flush through her body. The strongest queen in the underworld. The only woman to challenge the Leviathan, her sister, and push her to her absolute limits. Grafia Lucifuge. 
a melodious hum resonated from the silver-haired devil as her crimson orbs roamed along each individual in the room. After assessing each individual in the room, the woman's gaze seemed to fixate on Sasuke. Grafia. The woman donned a reserved smile at the relieved tone of Rias. Turning towards the crimson-haired teen, the silver-haired beauty clasped both of her hands together in front of her before bowing at the hip. Rias sama I felt a great disturbance and felt that it would be to everyone's benefit if I presented myself. She proceeded to shift her attention back to the two shinobi before tilting her head with narrowed eyes. We prefer these talks to be done as civilly as possible. I'm sure Lady Yusako would agree, yes? Sasuke's lip twitched downward at the woman's tone. Before he could reply with the vitriolic comment that sat on his tongue, Kakashi spoke up. Of course. His head bobbed lightly as he glanced toward Sasuke. Isn't that right, Sasuke? He made sure to put heavy emphasis on his rhetorical question. Sasuke's glare seemed to only deepen before he slowly rose to his feet. We're done here. He briefly glanced at Kakashi before holding out his fist for the man to tap. The ebony-haired teen ignored the look that his former sensei was sending him and continued to hold his fist out for the man. Kakashi sighed quietly before slowly rising to his feet and turning his attention to the two traumatized heiresses who were staring at Sasuke as if he were the Shinigami himself. The Shinto pantheon and yokai faction will look forward to whatever decision your leaders choose, have a good day. The masked Jonin then tapped his fist against Sasuke's own and they disappeared in the blink of eye, their presence completely vanishing as if never having been in the room. The silence permeated through the room for several long seconds before Grafia directed her attention to the two heiresses. What happened Rias sama The red-headed heiress grimaced at the question before avoiding eye contact with her brother's wife. We have a problem. A very big problem. The two shinobi reappeared on the outskirts of Kuo after leaving Kuo Academy. Sasuke glanced around his surroundings before shaking his head and slowly walking forward, no true destination in mind. Kakashi sighed quietly before reaching into his pocket and procuring his manga. He matched Sasuke's rather sedate pace and let the silence hang in the air for several minutes. You antagonized them. Kakashi stated rather than questioned. He placed his left hand into his pocket before continuing. It would have gone better had that woman not shown up. The Uchiha frowned momentarily before shaking his head. It was always a possibility. She's the wife of the current Lucifer as well as his queen, making Rias her sister-in-law. He shrugged a moment later as he continued speaking. It was a gamble that did not pay off but that means little. Our message was sent and all we need to do is wait for the devil's reaction. I'm truly interested in seeing what they will do. The masked Jonin hummed softly in acknowledgement before glancing at Sasuke out the corner of his eyes. Was such a display of power necessary though? Sasuke gave a non-committal shrug at the question. It got the point across. You traumatized those girls, Kakashi responded in an amused tone. They'll get over it, the Uchiha responded placidly. The two shinobi continued to aimlessly walk through Kuo with no destination in mind and didn't seem to notice their surroundings slowly changing and altering. They did, of course, but chose to not react in any way, shape or form. It seemed like the kitten's curiosity finally got the better of her. Oh? It appeared that the little kitty brought a couple of friends with her as well. Very powerful ones at that. As soon as Sasuke and Kakashi sensed the four individuals, a unique barrier seemed to form around them. It spanned out several dozen meters in all directions and seemed to wrap around them, surrounding them in a dome. Sasuke's eyes roamed along the black, cloud-like barrier and raised an eyebrow. Interesting. You sealed us off in a personal dimension. The Uchiha seemed to stare off into a random direction as he continued speaking. It's begrudgingly impressive. Naruto struggled immensely with creating space-time manipulation jutsus. Kakashi gazed along the dome for several seconds before sighing quietly and pocketing his hentai. It seems the kitty wants to fight, hum. He placed his left hand into his pocket as he shifted his weight onto his right leg. Why don't you all show yourselves? After a few seconds of silence, five individuals seemed to fade into existence several meters away from the shinobi. It revealed the forms of three men and two women. Two yokai, two humans, and a devil half-breed? Interesting. NYA, I told you Valley Coon. They're pretty strong. The playful voice of the female yokai sounded out. This woman was definitely Kuroka judging by the cat ears and twin tails. She wasn't even bothering to hide her features. The man named Valley stated at the two shinobi for a moment before a small smirk formed on his face. HMPH. Seems like I've finally found a worthy opponent. He took several steps towards the two shinobi before speaking. You there, he gestured toward Sasuke with his left hand. Fight me. The Uchiha stared at the silver-haired teen before scoffing quietly, and if I don't want to, he asked with a disinterested gaze. 
Valley's smirk seemed to grow as a pair of silver dragon wings manifested behind his back, the wings being a translucent bluish color. Then I'll force you to fight. After speaking Valley rocketed off toward Sasuke, destroying the concrete beneath his feet due to the sheer speed and strength of his movement. The silver-haired teen was but an inch away from his intended target, his left fist on course for Sasuke's right temple. He blinked in confusion when his fist slammed through Sasuke, whose form seemed to blur out of thin air. What? After image, Valley's senses went haywire and before he could attempt to protect himself, a vicious blow to his right cheek sent him careening back towards the direction he came from. The descendant of Lucifer crashed into the ground and skipped along the concrete, destroying a large portion of the earth as he did so. There was several seconds of silence that followed and it seemed that even Valley's allies were shocked by the display. TCH. Sasuke scoffed quietly before retracting his left fist. Kakashi, deal with him, he isn't worth my time. Before Kakashi could respond, Sasuke felt a rough tug at his chakra reserves. He blinked in confusion and immediately sensed the massive buildup of power that emanated from where he had buried Valley in concrete. Did that half-breed just steal his power? Divide? Valley's form practically exploded from the rubble and debris revealing the teen who barely had a scratch on his face. His translucent wings were now shining as bright as the sun, Sasuke's power coursing through the wings and enhancing Valley's own strength. Ho! Oh, that is going to be annoying to deal with. Kakashi commented with a serious expression. He could easily sense the monstrous boost of power that now resonated from the silver-haired teen. This was going to be an incredibly annoying fight. Whatever he just did, he absorbed my chakra to do so, he took a decent portion of it as well. Sasuke's Sharingan bled to life as he stared at the teen who donned a downright vicious smile on his face. I suspect that there's a limit. I highly doubt such an ability doesn't have its drawbacks. Sacred gear? Kakashi questioned, his charcoal eyes watching Valley's movements. The Uchiha narrowed his eyes for a moment before speaking. Alonginous at that, it resembles the divine dividing. Fuck. Kakashi muttered in annoyance. Most sacred gears, while unique and powerful in their rights, would never hold a candle to the 18 Longinus that existed. Divine dividing was quite possibly one of, if not the most annoying Longinus class sacred gear, possessing the ability to half an opponent's power and or attack every 10 seconds. Whether or not it could continuously do so without continuous physical attacks was up in the air. Very few individuals survived against wielders of Longinus class sacred gears. This sacred gear could kill even a god if given the chance. A small smirk formed on Sasuke's face as he stepped away from Kakashi, good luck. The Jonin scoffed quietly as his legs tensed, muscles coiling like a viper. Your sarcasm is appreciated. After his words the Jonin disappeared faster than lightning, meeting Valley head on with zero hesitation. A vicious shockwave rocked the barrier that sent giant pieces of debris hurtling through the air. Sasuke stated at Kakashi and Valley for a moment before directing his gaze towards the small group watching the two men fight. A small smirk formed on Sasuke's face as he slowly strolled towards their position. He was noticed almost immediately and saw how each individual tensed upon his approach. A cruel smile began to split his features as his Sharingan slowly morphed into its Mangeku variant. Let's talk. A sickening miasma of purple chakra began to emanate from Sasuke's position, forming what seemed to be a human skeleton around his body. The four individuals of Valley's group immediately took up defensive positions as the large samurai-looking construct neared their position. Sasuke was going to enjoy this very much, it was official, irrefutable. The divine dividing was absolute horseshit and completely unfair. And he had possessed a fucking Sharingan. Those things were bullshit incarnate. Don't even get Kakashi started on the damn Rinnegan. That thing was even more busted. But at this very moment, face to face with what was possibly the most annoying and stupid gimmick that Kakashi had ever come across. He was starting to rethink all of his choices that had let him make it this far in life. He should have just kicked the bucket after his father committed suicide. Life would have been so much easier and smoother. Cuss he'd be dead, you know? Wouldn't had to have assassinated men four times his age as a child. Wouldn't have had to repress all the physical, mental and emotional trauma he experienced during his 23 years of being an active duty shinobi for Konoha. Wouldn't have had to come home to witness his father's hanging corpse in the middle of the living room. Wouldn't have had to watch one of his closest friends sacrifice themselves to save him wouldn't have had to plunge his fist through the heart of his other best friend to save his home and village. Wouldn't have had to deal with a lot of shit now that he really thought about his shitty life. Perhaps he was just a masochist and he enjoyed getting the shit kicked out of him. Hmm. Yes yes yes, it all made sense, it was undeniable. Irrefutable, even. 
Life was full of surprise Kakashi's eyes widened as a fist appeared just on the outer peripheral of his vision, en route to take his head clean off his shoulders. Obviously he wasn't going to let that happen, he had just been caught off guard because he had been having an inner monologue. Valley was strong but he wasn't Naruto or Sasuke strong and that's all that really mattered, that's not to say that Kakashi could easily manhandle the teen either. Kakashi would give credit where it was due, the silver-haired teen was actually incredibly talented and boasted a good deal of power, even without that dumb-ass sacred gear of his. But Kakashi was Kakashi, and that's all the explanation that was really needed. Valley, of course, didn't know this tidbit of information and he was going to be in for a rude awakening when Kakashi decided to take this fight seriously. The silver-haired shinobi weaved just outside the range of Valley's attack, displaying a degree of dexterity that seemed to surprise the teen. Cold, charcoal eyes gazed into hazel eyes with disinterest. Kakashi's left hand barked with lightning, his feet shifting minutely and his hips pivoting on a dime. The lightning encased fist shot towards Valley's overextended elbow, aiming to incapacitate his joints and slow the boy down. The teen grit his teeth, lightning coursing through his body and pain flaring up in his now limp arm. Valley sought to lash out with his left leg and met nothing but air, only witnessing a blur of motion from the gray haired man. Nay. You should take this fight more seriously, Valley Kun. Kakashi chided with a raised eyebrow, several meters away from the teen. I'm liable to kill you, if not. Divide. Two things happened when Valley tried to call upon the power of his sacred gear. The first, and most noticeable, was that he didn't receive an influx of power from Albion. The second? Pain. Valley's world seemed to blur in front of him before he finally registered the familiar smell of ozone and burning flesh. He idly noted that someone was screaming. It took him another three seconds to realize that he was the one screaming. Partner. You need to wake up. Valley could distantly hear Albion shout his name from the inner confines of his mind, such was the pain that was coursing through his stomach. Pain, anger and adrenaline surged through Valley's pores before he finally moved. An awful and disgusting sound emanated from his body, similar to the sound of flesh being dissected and torn. Another wave of pain and agony seared through Valley's body before he finally glanced towards his stomach, his expression matched his pain, noticing the giant and smoking hole that he called his stomach. The smell of burnt flesh invaded his nostrils as blood continued to slowly seep out from the gruesome wound, painting a rather gruesome visage that failed to vacate his mind. What? Valley couldn't think straight. What the hell was happening? The descendant of Lucifer blinked and then the wound was gone, disappearing as if having never even existed. What? Partner, it isn't real, just an illusion. Albion's words snapped Valley back into cognitive reality. He blinked a total of three times, before realizing that he had yet to move from his previous exchange with the masked man. Hazel eyes glanced down towards his limp appendage, noticing that his arm was still experiencing the effects of the lightning attack he received from his opponent. An illusion. But when? He questioned to himself. How had the man caught him unaware? Illusions shouldn't have the power to influence his thoughts and actions. Albion made sure of that, so why? Ho! Oh, managed to see through that did you? Hazel eyes snapped towards the voice, growing sharper than steel as he stared at the masked man. Color me impressed. That was my strongest genjutsu. Though I'm no master like an old friend was I'm far from a slouch. Impressive. You're a dangerous one. Valley noticed, with a great deal of anger, that the man had one of his hands in his pocket, body completely relaxed. His eyes were dull and he gave off an aura of disinterest that rackled something furious in Valley. This man believed himself not a threat? Idiotic. Inconceivable. He was Valley Lucifer. Descendant of the original Satan. Wielder of one of the thirteen Longinus, divine dividing. How? How dare he? Demonic power radiated from Valley's position, bursting outward and surrounding him in a veil of, of dark energy. His power surged for a moment before skyrocketing and growing in intensity. The earth around him shattered before erupting, flinging debris and destruction to and fro. Kakashi watched the teen power up with a tired expression. Oh boy, he's upset now. Kakashi really only had himself to blame. This fight was going to be even more annoying now. Curse his bad luck. He already had Might Guy as a friend in the Elemental Nations. Hadn't he suffered enough? An angry curse escaped Kuroka's lips as she dodged the mighty swing from her opponent's large sword. She had already learned to not block against it. A pain scream emanated a few meters away from her, signifying that Bijou had yet to learn that lesson. Dumbass monkey. If she couldn't block the damn attacks while using Senjutsu what made him think he could? That. Thing's defense was incredulous, and the amount of chakra it was producing and generating made her knees weak. Any other time and she'd be positively drooling, 
wet even if she so eloquently thought to her. But right now, survival, this man was, perfect. Strong. Stronger than Valley. Attractive. Ruthless. A strangled scream split the air as the raven-haired teen commanded his chakra-infused samurai to create a tornado of flames that turned the earth to glass. She watched Bhikkhu get batted into the barrier walls of her creation and while she certainly felt a pang of sympathy for Bhikkhu, the idiot needed to learn to dodge. Le Fay. Dark energy encased Kuroka's hand as her demonic energy surged, mixing with her chakra. A torrent of black energy shot towards the Suzano-o just as a tornado of flames and a massive bolt of lightning struck the construct, coalescing the dark energy and causing an elemental explosion of destruction and chaos. Le Fay landed next to Kuroka, her normally soft and vibrant blue eyes now hardened to a degree that was quite unnatural. D did we get him? She asked with some measure of hope. Kuroka didn't bother answering, she already knew the answer, being so in tune with Senjutsu. The man's chakra construct hadn't even been phased, let alone damaged. Kami she was so turned on right now. Not even a little, NYA. The Nekosho replied glibly, he's far too strong for us to take on. Lefei's head turned towards Kuroka, eyes wide with surprise, what? What do you mean? The Nekoshu's tails idly swayed back and forth, watching as the smoke began to clear from their combined attack. I knew that these two were strong, nya. But they were suppressing their power by a fair amount in Kuo. They clearly wished to remain as inconspicuous as possible but when you're a talented sensor like myself, she preened as the glow from the Suzano's eyes pierced through the smoke screen, settling on her form. You can see the underlying power clear as day. Not a moment later did the smoke disperse, revealing the demonic-looking purple samurai construct, free of any damages and without nary a scratch or blemish. This is futile. Lefei's older brother commented, idly adjusting his glasses. We lack the firepower to even pierce that thing's armor. When the hell had he moved next to her? Something has to work. I mean, come on. Bhikkhu piped up next to her, staff resting against his shoulder and his burn wound slowly healing. What the hell? Where'd they come from? I guess we could try to throw literally everything at it and hope it does something, NYA? Kuroka questioned more than stated. It's better than nothing, Arthur stated with a sigh. And maybe we can talk. Lefei hesitantly replied. She shrank when three pairs of eyes focused on her. W what? Maybe we cannot fight. The three went silent at that, each digesting how that line of talk could form and whether or not it'd be beneficial or if the man would just continue to attack, not caring. Are you four done talking? An unfamiliar male voice sounded out from beside Bhikkhu. The four members of Team Valley physically jumped at the voice and their attention snapped towards the individual who was quite literally standing next to them, and their eyes widened in shock. For there, standing directly beside them was the teen commanding the samurai construct several meters away from them. His brow was raised and he had one of his hands in his pockets, completely disregarding them as a threat and not bothering to even hide it. Because they weren't a threat, Kuroka idly realized. What a humbling moment. Truly. Upon realizing the individual, Bhikkhu and Arthur immediately leapt away from the teen. Le Fay was rooted still, whether in fear or sheer resolve was up in the air. But judging by the fact that her knees were shaking, Kuroka would bet on the former rather than the latter. Kuroka's golden orbs trailed away from the handsome teen and towards the purple construct of chakra. She could sense the man's chakra signature in the samurai. So. A clone? Turning her attention back to the clone, a sly smile formed on her face. NYA, you're very strong. The ebony-haired teen just continued to blankly stare at Kuroka before shifting his gaze to Lefei. The girl's demeanor seemed to shrink even more so at his gaze and he idly noticed that the blonde male was tense. Sasuke returned his gaze to the Nekosho before finally speaking, his tone placid. Why are you here? Kuroka's head tilted, seemingly amused by the question. To find strong a mate, nya. Sasuke was unaffected. Yes. Kuroka was an incredibly beautiful woman but she was still an enemy, as of now, and she'd get treated as an enemy. An explosion of power emanated from where Kakashi and Valley were fighting and Sasuke glanced for a moment before returning his gaze to Kuroka. He had questions and his own curiosities about the woman in front of him, why she had done what she did and the consequences of her actions and why the yokai faction wanted her alive instead of dead. Obviously, she was one of the last of her kind but Yusaka was willing to shelter Kuroka and allow her safe haven in Kyoto free of retaliation from the devils, risking a potential future alliance with a powerful faction for one woman. For what reason? Sasuke wanted to know. Why? Kuroka's eyebrows furrowed in confusion for a moment. Why what? Sasuke took a step forward, uncaring of how uncomfortable the other individuals became. He was within reaching distance of Kuroka as he stared into her eyes. Why did you kill your master? 
Silence. Sasuke continued to observe the beautiful yokai in front of him before a familiar sensation pricked at his neck. His blood sang from deep within his veins and adrenaline coursed through his blood. Ah. He hadn't felt this in a long time. Killing intent. Kuroka's killing intent. So rare was it to see in this world due to the lack of natural chakra. Similar, to some degree, but entirely different. Chakra in the elemental nations was vastly superior to the chakra that existed here. But killing intent was killing intent. To harbor the ability to project such strong emotions with only your chakra was a skill that few even in his own world had possessed. A sickening wave of purple chakra seeped out of Kuroka's pores, causing an uncomfortable tension to waft in the area. Kuroka's own allies seemed shocked at the sudden change. Like a coin flip, she was no longer the carefree and spirited woman who lacked social decor. In her place, was a cold-hearted killer who lacked regret. Because I wanted to, she eventually stated, face blank. Her expression may have been blank but her emotions were not and Sasuke found that he recognized those emotions. Hate. Anger. Wrath. So very similar to his own yet so very different as well. He couldn't quite tell why though. But if she was going to lie directly to his face on the exact reasoning on why she did what she did. No one could blame him for antagonizing her. Your actions had consequences. The genocide of an entire race of beings. All on the back of one woman. Drunk off power she didn't truly understand. It was the exact thing to not say. But Sasuke feared little in this world and he'd get what he wanted from the woman regardless. The Nekoshu's eyes went blank and her body went still. Her head tilted, only a fraction, but moved nonetheless. A deadened look settled upon her face and every muscle in her body seemed to coil. It brought a smirk to Sasuke's face. An enraged opponent with a singular train of thought fixated on the absolute annihilation and evisceration of a target was the best opponent. Wrath could be one hell of a drug. Perhaps sensing the impending dread and death wafting off of Kuroka, the young blonde teen got as far away from Kuroka as physically possible. Smart move that. The Nekosho was one step away from imploding. Sasuke made sure it happened. You are the reason the Nekosho are extinct. Did Sasuke truly mean these words? No, of course not. As an individual who was on the tail end side of a genocidal massacre of an entire group of familial individuals, he had some pretty biased opinions genocides. But Kuroka regretted her actions. At least Sasuke believed so. Why else would the woman allow herself to be consumed by anger? Kuroka did not so much move as she disappeared, leaving an after image of herself. Her speed was quite impressive all things considered. Her form was perfect, her strike was phenomenal and her accuracy was spot on. It was just unfortunate that her opponent was Sasuke. The Uchiha shifted his body, arms moving in tandem with his feet. His left palm slapped Kuroka's fist across her guard effectively guarding from any further punches from her other arm. Sasuke's right fist chambered near his ribs and rocketed towards the woman's abdomen. Even through the haze of wrath and rage, Kuroka felt that blow. Eyes widening to saucers and spittle flinging from her lips. The sheer strength from the Uchiha's blow physically lifted her in the air for all but a second as her body instinctively hunched over from the brutal attack. Still recuperating from such a blow, Kuroka was unable to react as fingers dug deep into her scalp, grabbing a fistful of hair and yanking it with greater force than the initial attack upon her stomach. Even through her rage-induced state Kuroka understood the futility of her actions. A strangled scream tore through her vocal cords as her attacker practically smeared her body into the earth. Her back broke through several meters of hardened concrete and soil as her vision blackened. It was unfortunate that her attacker cared not for her pain. As Kuroka lay beaten in the crater, Sasuke did not relent. He positioned himself just above the woman, feet planted on either side of her hips while he bent his knees. Why? Kuroka scarcely heard him, but she did feel the pain from his next attack. Her stomach practically caving in due to the sheer force of his punch, it almost forced her to black out once more. But for some reason Kuroka stayed awake, weathering the pain and coughing up a worrying amount of blood. Why? Her tormentor asked once more. Those terrifying and, in her opinion, beautiful eyes stared down upon her. Weighing her worth and determining her very person, there was no judgment in his eyes, only bleak curiosity. Why did he want to know so badly? W.Y. Does it matter? She slurred painfully. She heard distant explosions and felt the rumbles of the earth from her incapacitated state but she knew not what was happening. The Uchiha continued to stare down at the girl before asking the same question. Why? Just a year ago he'd have killed someone for not answering a direct question. Would have strung their corpse up in the middle of a town and gazed disinterestedly as their body was picked apart by the wildlife. But he had changed from that person. And while patient, he was not above using violence to get his answer. 
Lightning barked in Sasuke's left fist and as he chambered his fist to strike once more, Kuroka whimpered. A tiny and quite pitiful sound escaping her throat. Her action caused the teen to halt, his head tilting as he raised an eyebrow. Through watery eyes, Kuroka spoke in a pained whisper. T to protect. My ass sister. A harsh exhale left her body as she clenched her eyes shut, not wishing to shed any more tears for those who had died due to her actions. Had Kuroka's eyes been open then she would have seen Sasuke's demeanor flip on a dime. His blank expression shifted as his eyes narrowed, though not in anger or sadness, but in sympathy. Kuroka awaited the next blow from the teen but it never came. Instead of feeling another earth-shattering punch to her ribs, she felt a gentle palm nestle on her navel. She felt the soil around her shift as a weight settled upon her thighs. Confusion led to curiosity as she slowly peeked an eye open and came face to face with the teen sitting on her lap. It made for a rather odd sight but she didn't care for it. The pain emanating from her stomach was slowly subsiding. Kuroka idly realized that he was healing her wound with chakra. W.Y. She groaned quietly, head raising ever so slightly. Sasuke said nothing for the first couple of seconds, seemingly ignoring Kuroka's comment. When the woman's head came back down upon the soil, Sasuke replied in a far softer tone than she would have expected. Your situation is similar to mine. When he did not elaborate Kuroka sighed quietly, pain tampering off into pleasure. How? She questioned with furrowed eyebrows. Sasuke's hand glided over the woman's toned abdomen, causing a shiver to rack Kuroka's body. Now was not the time. Ignoring the woman's response to his actions he spoke. I had an older brother. He paused, seemingly to gather his thoughts. Named Itachi. When I was a just a child, he cared for me. More than I ever would know. Sasuke's eyes seemed to glaze over as if reminiscing the memories of his brother. I come from a clan of warriors. Bred through combat and raised in violence. Hands soaked with blood and minds altered by trauma. We were a fearsome clan. Few could hope to match us and even less could tame us. Sasuke's hand no longer moved along her stomach and Kuroka realized her wounds were completely healed. Instead of moving or anything of the sort, she laid still, transfixed by Sasuke's words. Arrogance flowed through our veins with pride being our Novocaine. We were a mighty people whose downfall could only come from within. Sasuke's eyes closed as he idly laid his palms flat against Kuroka's abdomen. My brother was that individual. Kuroka was quiet for several moments as she digested the teen's words. Once realization dawned upon her she spoke softly. He. Killed your clan. Kuroka's golden orbs narrowed sadly as her ears pressed against her head, already coming to conclusions about how the teen could feel. Even if some of her assumptions were potentially incorrect, the pain was all too real for the boy. Sasuke inhaled through his nose as he closed his eyes. I loved him. He was my brother. My protector. My goal. I wanted to be like Itachi. Wanted to be better than Itachi. To surpass him. To be like him. He shook his head ruefully as he continued speaking, though this time his tone was bitter. He slaughtered our people in the dead of night with the aid of an exile. Made me relive all the brutal events of that night as if I was the one who had done the killing. After breaking my mind, he broke my body. Kuroka's face grimaced as the image of her little sister manifested in her mind. The girl's terrified gaze as she watched her elder sister go mad with Senjutsu and turning on their master. It was not a pleasant sight. I grew to hate him for what he did. Rightfully so. He took everything from me. I became hollow. Empty. Resented my beloved brother. Hated him. The teen then released a bitter chuckle. When I grew older, I made self-destructive decisions. Betrayed those I loved and respected. I have only myself to blame for these actions. But when I finally killed my brother. Finally got the revenge and justice that I and my family deserved. Anger seeped into his words as his fists clenched atop Kuroka's abdomen. Kuroka could do nothing but stare at the teen, completely mesmerized by his words and story. I learned that he killed the clan to stop them from causing needless death in my village. A coup d'etat that would have left our very home bloodied by civil war. My brother took it upon himself to eradicate the threat that was our people. Sasuke shook his head as his expression shifted from anger to bitter acceptance, but he could not kill his precious little brother. His love for me outweighed his duty as a soldier and he spared my life. Kuroka's eyebrows furrowed as she felt something wet land upon her stomach. She did not bother bringing attention to the single teardrop that fell from the teen's eye. I still hate him. Sasuke spoke with eyes closed. Hate what he did to me. Hate that he made me become what I am today. But I cannot stop loving him either. A few moments later passed as he opened his eyes, staring down into Kuroka's golden orbs. So I ask you once again, Kuroka. Said woman exhaled quietly as he finally uttered her name, eyes intense and expression hardened. Why? 
Kuroka was silent as she digested everything that had been told to her. She had come to the realization that this man was similar to her, if only in reverse. Whereas her younger sister and race had suffered the consequences of her actions, he had suffered the consequences of his elder brother's actions. Their roles reversed but the pain they shared. Kuroka couldn't and wouldn't allow Sharon to suffer at the hands of that shitty devil she called a master. Her baby sister was all she had after her parents' death. She'd die before allowing the younger girl to come to harm. And yet she had abandoned her when the girl needed her most. Kuroka had no idea that her actions would have caused such suffering and pain to not only her people but to her sister. By inadvertently saving Sharon from the torture and suffering of her former master, she had damned the girl to a life of pain and fear. Actions that she regretted of course, but one that she would never take back. Kuroka loved her sister more than life itself. If there had been a better way then she would have taken it but the past was the past. Stealing her eyes, Kuroka gazed into Sasuke's mismatched orbs with resolve, because I love my sister, and I'd do it all over again if it meant that her safety was guaranteed. Sharon had been adopted by the Gremory clan's heiress shortly after her actions and while she had been furious that another devil held control over her sister, at least it was with a clan that loved their servants. It was not like Kuroka had any say in the matter. She had been too busy avoiding the devils that were sent to kill her. How would Kuroka have known that the devils would target her race? It just wasn't fair for the entirety of the blame to be put upon her shoulders. She knew this of course, but it was easier said than done. That guilt was ever present and stood upon her shoulders. Perhaps one day it would ease. Sasuke stared down into Kuroka's eyes for several moments before opening his mouth to speak. Just as he was about to speak another ridiculously powerful shockwave surged through Kuroka's barrier, emanating from Kakashi and Valley's position. Sasuke rose his head towards the direction and a small frown appeared on his face. Kakashi wasn't going to last long against Valley's balance breaker. How powerful was this kid? TCH. He scoffed before slowly rising to his feet, offering his hand to Kuroka who seemed surprised at the action. She stared at the appendage for all but a second before grasping it and allowing the teen to pull her to her feet. Her golden orbs glanced towards the direction of Valley as she raised an eyebrow. Valley is using his balance breaker. Your friend must be pretty strong NYA. Sasuke did not respond as he jumped out of the crater he had forced Kuroka into, the Nekosho following immediately after. Crossing his arms against his chest, Sasuke's Sharingan bled to life. Why did you attack us? An amused smirk formed on Kuroka's face as she replied, Valley loves to fight. He's a battle maniac. An annoyed frown graced Sasuke's visage as he followed the form of Valley's draconic looking armor. He spied a blur of lightning, definitely Kakashi, who was barely dodging and weaving out of Valley's attacks. And what happens when I eventually crush him? Sasuke questioned placidly. Kuroka blinked at the question before a sultry smile formed on her face. He'll just want to fight you even more NYA. Yeah. No that wasn't going to happen. Something told Sasuke that if he let Valley live, he'd be an annoying problem later on down the line. Sasuke loved a good fight, don't get him wrong but he preferred fighting on his terms. Valley seemed like the asshole to just force you to fight. And Sasuke had little patience in regards to pushy individuals. He wasn't Naruto. He didn't cater to people just because he could. Then I'll just kill him. Sasuke casually spoke before disappearing in a burst of speed to fast for Kuroka to follow. Kuroka took all but three seconds to truly digest the words spoken by Sasuke. Her eyes widened before shouting. NYA. Don't do that. The Nekosho made to follow after Sasuke before hearing a pained groan from behind her. She shifted in the balls of her heels before spotting the rest of Team Valley laying on the ground, unconscious. She stared at them for several seconds before glancing back towards Valley's direction with a frown. With a heavy sigh, Kuroka made her way to her allies to check on them and see if they were okay. What an annoying ass ability. Kakashi's body blurred as lightning coursed through his hands, illuminating his form. For every attack he did against Valley, the teen would either shrug off or divide. It didn't help that the teen was rather skilled at hand to hand and had a plethora of other abilities and long range attacks to nullify most of his arsenal. Why did he always have to be the one at a disadvantage? Raiden. Raiju Suiga. A hound made entirely of lightning formed from the Raiden chakra in Kakashi's hands. It released a vicious howl before blitzing towards valleys at speeds that would make actual lightning jealous. The silver-haired devil weaved around the first attack, eyes focused on the lightning trail that connected from the hound directly to Kakashi's hands. His hand made to sever the electrical current before the lightning hound reappeared on the edge of his peripheral. Valley's eyes widened as the beast increased its speed at the very last second. Valley crossed his arms against his chest to block the attack and instead of feeling lightning run through his body, a vicious physical blow cracked him in his temple. 
Momentarily stunned by the sudden blow to his face, Valley was unprepared for the lightning beast to reappear in his face, electrical teeth shining brightly. The beast clamped its jaws down upon his left leg and proceeded to explode, consuming Valley and a several meters of earth near him. Kakashi shook the last remaining remnants of Raiden Chakra out of his hands before shifting his weight on his back foot. He had learned early on in the fight that if Valley was preoccupied by two simultaneous attacks, then the boy had to choose which thing to divide. Divide the power from the physical blow, which in turn would divide Kakashi's power or divide the power of the ability he was being hit with, thus making the attack weaker but never once dividing Kakashi's actual power. The team could not do both or at least Kakashi had come to this conclusion based on the multiple times that he had physically struck Valley at the same time as releasing a jutsu upon him. But this method only delayed the inevitable outcome of the fight. A fight of attrition that Kakashi was practically guaranteed to lose, he wasn't a stamina-based fighter and he likely never would be. He was meant for quick and powerful executions, though, that's not to say he couldn't outlast his opponents because he had done that plenty of times, but this particular fight was one he'd lose eventually. He just couldn't land a solid enough blow that would incapacitate the teen. Everything was either half power or shrugged off and eventually healed. It was like fighting Naruto all over again to up his skills when the Mugen Tsukuyomi failed. Naruto could shrug off Kakashi's strongest techniques with ease and just keep fighting as if nothing had happened. It was so damn annoying, if he still had Obito's Mangekyu Sharingan then he would have already decapitated Valley with Kamui. Kakashi sensed a buildup of power before placing his hands together and summoning ten cage bunchins to his side. Nine of the physical clones disappeared in a burst of speed as one clone remained, hands blurring through several hand seals. Kakashi himself matched his clone as both released a relatively powerful jutsu. The real Kakashi leapt into the air while clapping his hands together, before releasing his jutsu, Sweden, Bakusu Shuha. His chest expanded nearly three times its original size before water practically exploded out of his mouth. The condensed waves of water shot towards Valley's position as his clone finished its jutsu. Raiden. Jibashi. The clone placed his hands atop the earth before generating a blinding amount of lightning. The lightning spread through the ground, ripping and tearing the earth before colliding with the massive wave of water produced by Kakashi. Valley emerged from his smokescreen with minor burns that were slowly healing and paused for a moment as a literal tsunami of lightning-charged water crashed into him. The silver-haired teen released a pain scream before activating his sacred gear, divide, and yet the pain continued to course through his veins as his sacred gear released a powerful shockwave of energy, expelling the excess power from Kakashi's move. Valley released several grunts of pain as he struggled to move his body, the lightning continuously shocking his nerves and preventing his movement. Straining every aching muscle in his legs, Valley finally managed to move out of the water. Before he could even catch his breath, Kakashi appeared directly in front of him. Time seemed to slow down as charcoal eyes met hazel orbs. Kakashi's form emerged from the tidal wave of water and lightning with little struggle, as if he was completely immune to the effects of both elements. Valley spotted the condensed form of lightning sparking from Kakashi's hands and tried to shift his body defensively. But he wasn't quick enough. Kakashi closed the distance near instantaneously as his right hand dug directly into Valley's abdomen, piercing the boy's stomach and burning his insides. Valley released a scream of pain before being launched into the air by the man's sheer strength. His body was sent careening into the air and before he could try to right himself using his wings, he was struck multiple times by a lightning-encased fist, body ragdolling through the air but never losing altitude. Just as Valley reached the apex of his climb through the air, Kakashi appeared directly above him with his right hand reared back past his head. Rakuri. Soraishin. Valley was unable to follow the attack as Kakashi's fist struck directly through his chest. First came the initial pain and then came the inevitable downfall. The descendant of Lucifer broke the sound barrier as his body was sent hurtling towards the earth, crashing into the hardened cement and concrete. The worst of all. Kakashi wasn't even done. With lightning still encasing his hands, he bit his thumb before spreading it across his torso and forming a single hand seal. His form became encased in a cloak of sheer lightning, similar to the fourth Reikajat. Raiden no Yoroi. Kakashi's hair spiked up in an abnormal way as the Raiden chakra surged through his entire body, enhancing his neural senses, speed and physical reactions. After taking a single second to adjust to the change, Kakashi's form quite literally disappeared and reappeared just a foot above Valley's crippled form. So fast was Kakashi that Valley had yet to register the fact that the Jonin was directly above him with his fist reared back. Raideningu Sudoreto. Kakashi's fist struck Valley so fast that the concrete surrounding them practically eviscerated, turning into pure dust. 
A second passed by before a tremendous explosion engulfed Valley and Kakashi. The silver-haired Jonin flickered out of the smokescreen, his glowing form breathing heavily, lightning flickering in an unstable manner. Now that had to have done some severe damage, if it didn't, Kakashi was quite literally fucked. His lightning armor was nowhere near as perfected as eyes once had but he had the gist of it under control. Valley had just been struck a total of 22 times in rapid succession with various forms of lightning enhanced punches and then was quite literally struck with Kakashi's strongest move in his arsenal. Just stay the fuck down kid. Kakashi thought tiredly, chest heaving heavily while his sweat instantly evaporated due to the lightning cloak surrounding his body. The silver-haired Jonin tensed for a moment as a bright light emanated from the dust of his previous attack. Valley's power doubled, then tripled, then quadrupled as he heard an unfamiliar voice through the smog of dust and smoke. Divine dividing. Scale male. The voice was a deep baritone. Regal and powerful. Ancient. Oh, for fuck's sake. Kakashi tiredly groaned, witnessing the smokescreen disappear revealing Valley's balance breaker. He knew nothing about the balance breaker of divine dividing. Greet. Cool. Kami, he was so fucked. To push me into using my balance breaker. Congratulations, mongrel. Valley insulted yet praised as he slowly walked towards Kakashi's position, his white draconic armor glinting brightly. Tell me, what is your name? Kakashi frowned beneath his surgical mask, glancing towards unstable lightning flickering off his body. He turned his eyes back towards Valley before speaking. Kakashi. Hitaki. The Jonin rolled his neck before stretching his body out. Welp. Time to lose. Kakashi thought realistically. While not completely out of chakra, he had only a few powerful jutsus in the tank and his lightning cloak was becoming unstable. Well then, Kakashi Hitaki. Valley mocked degradingly. Prepare yourself. It'll be over quickly. The armored teen bent his knees in preparation. Ma. I'm counting on it. Kakashi lazily replied, feigning confidence he didn't truly have. He could sense the sheer volume of power that Valley's balance breaker bestowed upon him. It was bullshit. How come he could just rejuvenate all of his previous power and then proceed to triple it? Absolute horseshit. Before Valley could move from his spot nine clones of Kakashi burst through the cement, each with jutsus ready to be unleashed on the teen. Sweden. Swiryuden no jutsu. Katen. Karyuenden. Futan. Daitopa. Doden. Yomi Numa. Raiden. 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 Shiden. Katen. Gukaku no jutsu. Raiden. Sandabaruto. Each clone launched their techniques instantly, all nine of the abilities closing in on Valley's seemingly unprepared form. Divide. 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 Kakashi's eyes widened in shock as the teen proceeded to divide each jutsu back to back with no cooldown. What the fuck? Oh you gotta be fucking kidding me. Kakashi cursed as each of his clones dissipated, knowing that staying would only hamper their master. Kakashi's reserves nearly doubled as the remaining chakra from his clones returned to him. His previously flickering lightning cloak stabled out before bursting with renewed strength, lightning barking loudly in response to the increase in power. What a bullshit ability. This kid's sacred gear was on a whole other level of stupid. If it wasn't for that dumbass crutch then Valley would be a burning amalgamation on the earth. Kakashi sighed quietly before his senses practically screamed at him. His eyes dilated as Valley seemed to appear directly in front of him with his fist nearing his jaw. Kakashi's enhanced reflexes allowed him to weave out of Valley's supersonic punches. Left. Right. Weave. Duck. Duck. Left. Right. The Jonin was forced completely on the defensive as Valley continued to throw punches with finesse, speed and power. Kakashi's enhanced nerves and vision spotted an opening for a mere millisecond. His feet shifted faster than most could follow and his upper torso tightened, shoulder squaring and arms tucking into his sides with his fists raised in front of him reminiscent to that of a boxer's stance. Kakashi's feet glided along the concrete before he ducking under one of Valley's punches, he took a step into Valley's guard before shooting his fist directly into Valley's armor, right where his right kidney would be located. Kakashi's lightning-encased fist made direct contact with Valley's armor, crunching the metallic fiber and releasing a shockwave of power from his blow. Valley released a pained wheeze before rolling with the blow, not allowing Kakashi to capitalize on his attack. Stepping into Kakashi's own guard, Valley's left hand gripped Kakashi's outstretched arm, Ignoring the searing pain from the lightning cloak, Valley snagged the man's arm down. A disgusting pop was heard as Kakashi's arm was wrenches from its socket. The man released little more than a quiet grunt before shifting both of his feet and jumping into the air. Using his speed and momentum, Kakashi gripped Valley's arm that was holding onto his own before flipping over the teen. He ignored the way his shoulder protested at the action and instead used all of his strength to lift Valley off his feet. 
Kakashi proceeded to slam the teen into the earth, before rearing his right fist back to punch the boy in his armored head. Before his fist could strike the teen, he was sent rocketing away by the teen's armored foot. Kakashi grunted in pain as his body rag dolled along the earth, crashing multiple times before righting himself with several flips. Kakashi righted himself before landing on one knee and gripping his left arm. His teeth grit quietly as he forced his arm back into its socket. His lightning cloak sparked for a moment before feeling the armor fluctuate. Divide. 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 A shockwave of excess energy exploded from behind Valley's form as he divided Kakashi's lightning cloak and power. Kakashi heaved quietly as his chakra cloak and power was halved. His lightning cloak flickered for a moment before disappearing a second later. The Jonin's eyes widened at the action and he immediately tried to move as Valley appeared directly in front of him with his foot reared back to strike Kakashi. The silver-haired Jonin crossed his arms against his chest before being struck by the descendant of Lucifer. The man became a blur of movement as his body skipped along the hardened earth. Kakashi eventually crashed into the ground before struggling to his feet. Sweat cascaded down his form, dripping down his face and splashing onto the soil beneath him. The Jonin struggled to his feet before dropping to a knee and releasing a ragged sigh. Fuck. He thought tiredly. Little shit practically drained me. What a shitty situation. It almost reminded Kakashi of the time he had fought against Nagato in Konoha. He had been completely outclassed by the man. Reduced to a mere child even. While he had certainly caught the man off guard a handful of times and nearly decapitated the diva path, he had still ultimately lost that fight. Chakra reserves running on empty and body aching. Kakashi released a tired sigh. Resolve refusing to be broken he slowly gathered what remaining strength he had before standing to his feet. The Jonin rolled his neck once to the left before repeating the action in the opposite direction. If Kakashi was going to lose then he was going to lose with style. The Jonin placed both of his hands into the torn remnants of his pockets before fixing Valley with a bored stare. His pristine dress shirt was torn and shredded and he was missing a suspender. His surgical mask clung off one ear torn and shredded, revealing the lower half of his face. The Jonin breathed in deeply before speaking. Ma. You're not so strong Valley Kun. You rely too much on that sacred gear. If Kakashi couldn't take physical shots at the boy anymore then he'd definitely attack the boy's pride. All's fair in love and war as they say. An amused laugh resounded from Valley as he neared Kakashi, not rising to take the bait. Says the man on his last dregs of life. You were strong. The strongest individual I've fought so far. As Valley neared, a torrent of bright energy began to form in his hands. Get stronger and perhaps one day you can properly challenge me. Valley took aim with his right hand, the compressed demonic energy coalescing and vibrating rapidly. Just as he was about to blast Kakashi away with his power, Albion screamed a warning in his mind. Partner. But it was far too late. Aminate Hikara. Valley's eyes widened upon seeing Kakashi's ally just appear out of thin air. His nostrils caught the distinct smell of burnt flesh and was confused for all but a second before glancing down. Valley couldn't properly process what had happened in such a short amount of time. He didn't even see the teen move when he appeared. One moment he was standing directly in front of him and then the next the boy's fist was through his stomach. Enten. Chidori. Pain. Valley's body tensed as he screamed in agony from the black flames that were eating away at his flesh faster than he could heal from. What is this? What was happening? Valley could idly hear Albion shouting in the back of his mind but the dragon's voice was muffled. Horrible, awful pain. The heat. The agony. Make it stop. Stop 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 stop. Valley's sacred gear responded to his agony and began to glow and power up. As Valley was in the process of powering up into his juggernaut drive form something happened. Something that managed to strike fear deep into his very veins. You seem proud of this power. Sasuke spoke cruelly. The flames of Amaterasu seemed to expand before being snuffed out entirely, leaving Valley's stomach burnt and gaping. Allow me to take it away. Sasuke's fist vacated its position before he shoved it into Valley's chest causing the teen to release another scream of agony. Purple chakra began to form on the spot where Sasuke's fist lay. Ninjendo. Valley's pain seemed to just. Stop. Wa. Why? What was. Happening? Why could he no longer hear Albion? His power. Where did it go? What was happening? Valley struggled to remain standing, not understanding what was happening to his body, it wasn't responding. Why did he feel so cold? And so tired? So, so very, tired? Valley's body slammed into ground as his thoughts finally ceased. Sasuke stared down at the dead teen before glancing towards the sole of the sacred gear in his hands still in the form of a pair of wings. Ah. So Sasuke's hunch had been right. 
similar to Naruto and the other Jinchuriki he could sense two beings inhabiting Valley's body. Obviously one of the beings being Valley's very own soul but as well as the soul of the sacred gear. He knew the very basics of the divine dividing but hadn't actually known that a real dragon had been sealed inside of it. Interesting. A tired sigh resounded out from behind Sasuke as Kakashi dropped to the ground to take a rest. Sasuke glanced towards the man before just staring at him. After several seconds of silence, Kakashi spoke with a raised brow. What? The Uchiha continued to stare at the man for several seconds before replying slowly. Eh? Hey, mole? Kakashi was silent for a moment before offering a lazy shrug. I just like wearing masks. I'm not insecure about it. Sasuke continued to stare for several more seconds before shaking his head and dropping the matter. The man had made such a big deal about having his face covered when they were younger that Sasuke had suspected that Kakashi possessed scars or burns that he didn't like. A mole. That was it. How stupid. Sasuke glanced at the sacred gear in his hand, eyebrows furrowing as it pulsed with power. He was silent for a few moments before glancing towards Kakashi and throwing the object at his former sensei. Kakashi scrambled to catch the object, confused for a short few moments. The hell are you doing? Sasuke shrugged his shoulders before turning towards the direction he could sense Kuroka. Take it. It's yours now. You killed Valley after all. The Jonin glanced at the item before shaking his head. Yeah. Wrong. Spoils of war. Kakashi held the object out for Sasuke to take, who refused. I don't need it. He stated simply. Kakashi's eyebrows furrowed for a moment at the response. Well, of course Sasuke didn't need it but why not just take it? This sacred gear was. Stupid. Strong. Powerful. It could help bridge the gap that existed between him and Naruto. Why wouldn't he take it? Unless. Charcoal eyes glanced towards the last remaining Uchiha, eyes sharp and calculative. He witnessed Sasuke's left hand grip his kusanagi, a nervous habit he never seemed to be able to shake. But why? Oh. Oh. Ah. Ah. How sweet of you Sasuke-kun. So very thoughtful. Kakashi responded playfully with a small smile. Sasuke ignored the urge to cast Amaterasu on his former sensei. He so very badly wanted to, but not today. Shut up, Kakashi. Kakashi chuckled quietly before glancing towards the sacred gear in his hands. If anyone was going to have this incredibly stupid and bullshit ability then it might as well be Kakashi. He always did enjoy annoying the ever-living fuck out of his opponents, it was a part of his charm. Now. How did this thing work? Was he like supposed to put it on or? Kakashi stared at the object for several seconds before shrugging his shoulders and just winging it. Uh, hey, sacred gear thing, can I use you, or something? Nothing happened for several seconds and Kakashi just assumed that that wasn't how it worked. Up until a bright glow emanated from the sacred gear, nearly blinding both men. When the light finally died down and both men were able to see without being blinded, Kakashi heard Sasuke speak. Huh. The look suits you. Kakashi blinked several times before turning his head and spotting the translucent wings that clung to his back. Neat. Just neat? Is that all you have to say? Kakashi blinked several times as the familiar voice he had heard when fighting Valley made itself present but this time from within the confines of his mind. Uh. Hello? Hello human. The entity responded in kind. Huh. Interesting. The sacred gear was sentient. Like Sasuke, Kakashi only knew the barest amount of information regarding divine dividing. So you're, sentient? Kakashi questioned curiously. My name is Albion but many know me by other titles. The White Dragon. The Vanishing Dragon. Albion Gwyber. The White Dragon Emperor and even the White Dragon Emperor of Supremacy. I am one of the two heavenly dragons. Wow. That's a lot of titles. Kakashi commented, idly impressed by the former dragon's accomplishments. After all, Kakashi himself had earned many a moniker in his days. So like, how did you become a sacred gear? Well, that uh, that's a long story, the powerful dragon seemed almost, embarrassed. Who? There's an amusing story there, Kakashi responded, tone full of mirth and amusement. Albion was silent for several moments before clearing his throat and replying, perhaps another time. Now tell me, what is your name partner? Kakashi blinked before a small smile formed on his face, Kakashi Hitaki, though I'm known by many monikers as well. The copy Nin Kakashi. Cold-blooded Kakashi and even Sharingan no Kakashi, though that last one no longer applies. Albion was silent for a few moments before the dragon replied, his tone power and mighty. Well then, Kakashi Hitaki, it is a pleasure to meet you. I do hope we'll grow even stronger together. Kakashi donned a small smirk upon his face before replying out loud, it is nice to meet you as well Albion, 
I hope that I am able to impress you. Albion responded almost immediately after Kakashi's statement. You have already done that and much more. Valley was an incredibly powerful host. Were it not for my power then you would have most certainly killed him. Kakashi slowly stood to his feet waving off Sasuke's questioning gaze. He felt so rejuvenated now. Almost like the time that Naruto had shared his chakra during the war. That had been an exhilarating experience. So. Now what? The Jonin questioned as he saddled up to Sasuke's side. Not bothering to deactivate divine dividing. Sasuke was silent for a few moments as he watched Kuroka and her little group make their way towards he and Kakashi's position. We offer asylum to Kuroka. He replied quietly. Kakashi briefly hummed before reaching into his pocket and pulling out his hentai manga. A heavy sigh escaped him as he noticed that the manga booklet was practically ruined. Why? Why must I suffer? He questioned sadly. Seek help. Sasuke replied placidly. Kakashi fell to his knees in anguish as he held the ruined booklet in his hands. My book. Sasuke breathed in deeply, right hand gripping his left wrist tightly. He wanted to chidori Kakashi through his neck. Just breathe Sasuke. Just breathe. Several seconds passed by in silence as both shinobi remained silent. Sasuke out of annoyance and Kakashi out of sadness. It took Kuroka and her small group of allies a few more seconds to reach them and when they did they were completely surprised to see Kakashi wielding the divine dividing. It took only a second longer for them to spot Valley's unmoving corpse. The reactions of each of the individuals varied heavily with Lafay looking rather sad and Arthur only being curious. So you really killed him, huh? Kuroka uttered quietly. While she wasn't the closest friend of Valley due to his rather cold and standoffish demeanor, she didn't dislike him. He was rather okay to be around. She enjoyed annoying him and traveling around the world looking for powerful people to fight. It was kind of sad. Kuroka glanced toward Sasuke's ally and noticed his rather depressed state. In his hands was a torn and rather destroyed looking manga book. Was that a? Oh, it was. Huh. Small world. Uh. What's his deal, NYA? Kuroka questioned with a tilt of the head. Sasuke shook his head with a flat expression. Ignore him. He's being a child. My baby is dead. How will I ever recover? Kakashi muttered quietly. The Nekosho glances at the man for a few moments before turning her golden eyes upon Sasuke. You sure he'll be okay? He looks. Not well NYA. He'll live. Sasuke replied bluntly. Now, what are you going to do? The Nekosho glanced to her allies for a moment before shrugging her shoulders, breasts bouncing ever so slightly at the action. I guess we'll be heading back to the Chaos Brigade. Ofis Sama will want to know about Valley's disappearance, NYA. Sasuke gestured with her left hand before replying. Yusaka has granted you asylum within the Yokai faction under the protection of the Shinto Pantheon. The Nekosho was taken aback by Sasuke's words, W what? Really? The Uchiha nodded his head as he replied, Your crimes will be pardoned should you accept her offer. The Nekosho was quiet for several moments as she digested the teen's words, She wouldn't have to be in the run anymore? That sounded. Nice. And the Chaos Brigade? I gave Ofis Sama my word that I'd help her as long as she kept me away from the devils who wanted to hunt me down, NYA. Sasuke's eyebrow raised before he responded, we can talk to Ophis later. He casually waved her concern off not making a big deal out of knowing who the dragon was. W wait. You know Ophis sama The monkey yokai, Biku, asked in shock. Sasuke glanced towards the teen as he responded. My team and I were recruited by Ophis herself. We are to aid in her plan to remove Great Red when she calls upon us. But in the meantime, she has allowed us to do what we like. He glanced towards Kakashi who finally seemed to recover from his mental lapse. Ofis Chan is quite unique. The Jonin commented with a small smile. Chan? Lefei squealed in surprise at the casual and intimate honorific. Kakashi nodded idly while placing his hands into his pockets. She all but demanded that I call her Ofis Chan, she's rather adorable. If you ignore the fact that she has enough power to bend reality in space and can eviscerate large masses of land with barely a glance. He ended his statement with an eye smile, but not really because his mask was kinda hanging off his face. It was just a normal smile. Uh. Well, what about them, NYA? Kuroka gestured to the small group behind her. Sasuke didn't bother glancing to the remaining members of Team Valley. What about them? He asked bluntly. The entirety of Team Valley grimaced at the uncaring tone. Damn. This guy was cold. Air. Kuroka wilted for a moment as she glanced towards the group. I'd like if they came with me. Well, that is if they want to, NYA. Sasuke's mismatched orbs traveled away from Kuroka before settling on the small group behind her. His presence seemed to wash over them, 
eyes judging them and assessing their worth. Of course they can join. Kakashi butt in with a rather jovial tone. But if they do anything even remotely sus, I'll kill them. The Janin smile was a touch too bright and caused the hairs on the back of Team Valley's neck to raise. Whatever. Sasuke eventually replied, not truly caring if the stragglers joined or not. NYA. Kuroka cheered happily as she bounced up and down in excitement. The things it did to her chest. What a beautiful sight. The Uchiha felt Kakashi prod his ribs with a knowing a smile. Sasuke flipped him off for it. To be continued.